We call the meeting to order. This is the Holyoke City Council uh, Finance Subcommittee. Uh, my name is Joe McGivern. To my right is Mike Sullivan, City Councilor at Large. To my first left is Jim Leahy, City Councilor at Large. And next to Jimmy is Peter Tallman, City Councilor at Large. We have a, a good size agenda this evening. We're going to get a couple items out of the way, bounce around a little bit, and hope to get out of here in timely fashion. The, um, the first item was laid on the table at the last meeting. That's our previous minutes from April 9th. Make a motion after the correction, accept the uh, minutes from April 9th. Second. Motion made second to remove from the table for the purpose of accepting the minutes with the corrections. Is there any discussion? On that motion, all those in favor? Any opposed? The minutes are accepted with corrections. Item number two was just introduced by Councillor Valentine. I placed it on the agenda after talking to her and talking to the assessors. Uh, it's it's a, in order that would have the assessors come in and explain there, and I have no idea why we got this feedback. We have the assessors come in. Yeah. That the assessors would come in to explain the assessment purposes, how they determine values, growth of residential, commercial, and personal property. Um, I, I spoke to the assessors, and our chief assessor is not only on vacation but out of state at the moment. Our uh, second assessor, Debbie Burnell, was available, but on, after speaking with the maker of the order, she would prefer that both assessors would be present and that at least Tony as the uh, chief assessor would be here. So I would suggest that we lay this on the table for motion, you know, table. motion made a second to keep item two on the table. Any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, no, back to item one, the previous minutes. We also have the minutes uh, received uh, recently for May 7th for our last meeting. Could uh, we take those up? Where are they? I think they sent them to us. I don't have them. You don't have them? Email, right? Maybe yeah. I got to read them. They're both in the same attachment. Yeah, I got the attachment. Okay. We uh, just keep them uh, on the table then until we get to read them. I, I just got the email uh, this afternoon on them with the, with the previous minutes. All right. Why don't we lay. Oh, Friday? Yeah. Lay item. Um, lay the minutes for May 7th on the table. Okay. Second. So we have time to read them. Okay. All those in favor? Any right. opposed? So moved. We're waiting for Councillor McGee for, and uh, Rory Casey for two items here. Um, if we can quickly, we can possibly do item number three. Make a motion to take item three off the table. Motion second. for a second to take item three off the table. This is a request for $4,000 being transferred from pay plumbing inspector to inspection plumbings. This is out of the building department. Uh, Damian Cody and I have communicated back and forth. Uh, Damian is unavailable this evening, however, just for the committee's information, and if you so wish to go forward. The uh, plumbing inspector is no longer with us, the person who held that position, and the inspection plumbing is something that would be what Damien would use this money for, for on a temporary basis to get through the rest of the year. Um, it seems to be in order, but if there are questions, we can get further answers from Damien. What's your, what's your prayer? I, I, I have no problem. I have no problem with that. I, I make a motion that we accept the transfer. Second. Well, it's may said that we accept okay. and recommend that we adopt the transfer. Oh. Councilor Bartley. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. So, um, and I appreciate we want to expedite this, but what's the status of the plumbing inspector? Do we are we are we advertising for a plumbing inspector? What, where, what are we? What are we doing? That, that's a good question. That would be the, the uh, prerogative of the department head. At the moment, he is looking to fill the position. As far as I, my understanding, he's looking to fill the position. I don't want to put words in his mouth. Okay, so I just want to... So this is $4,000 to, to do what, exactly? It's going from plumbing inspector, which is the salary line item for that position, yeah. into inspections plumbing to pay for the inspections in the plumbing area. It's to help them get through the rest of the year. Right, so who's, 
and so, so Joe, just, just help me, just walk me through. So we don't have a plumbing inspector, that, that person resigned. And who's doing the inspections now? And how, how do you come up with the 4,000? Is that, is that just money left over? Or does he, does, he need to, does he need to support that, Joe, in any way? Just, I mean, in other words, does he say, you know, based upon the number of inspectors we have left, there might be 32, I'm gonna need a $4,000, Mr. Chairman. Is that what he says? Or does, does he just say, I got $4,000 left over and in the, in, in the, in the budget, uh, and so that's, I want $4,000. The, the surplus is because it's the salary line item, and the auditor is here this evening. I'm not sure if we can add a couple of things to this. But the, it's the salary line item which is a surplus because it's not, the position is not filled. The need is an inspection plumbing related to the position not being filled and for Damien to be able to use this money to complete inspections you know, th through the rest of the fiscal year. Okay, so I, and what I thought, that's what I thought it was, Joe. I thought it was the, the latter. In other words, there's money left over. He wants to move it, but he doesn't really support any, with anything in front of you. There's nothing to support it, right? It doesn't, it, he doesn't say, for example, we have 50 inspections left and we need $4,000. I mean, is there, is there a rational basis um, uh, for this? I mean, should, should we get a rational basis? Rory has it. I'm sorry. Rory I mean, I, I, guess, I guess if there's money left over, I, I, I mean, I... Fine, but I mean, you know, Joe, I would, I would think, I mean, he's been doing this a while, he has. Hmm. He could say, because we have this many inspections based upon my experience, I need $4,000. Oh, yeah, if you would. Uh, well, Here's to spend the rules to allow Mr. Casey to approach so, on this item. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you, Rory. No problem. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, the uh, plumbing inspector that we had, um, had to resign for their own reasons. Um, what happens in the building department, and this is very uh, similar in, in all of our surrounding communities, is um, right now the East Hampton um, plumbing inspector will come over the mountain and will uh, conduct the inspections. They're not a city employee, they're an independent contractor. So that's why this <coughs> is in front of you because it's transferring from a personnel line into an expense line. So this is Damien's estimate uh, for the end of the year based on trends um, on what will need to be spent. Uh, it's about $4,000 if, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, so that's, it's a, it's a per inspection cost. I, I can't tell you it's $75 an inspection, $100 an inspection, but I can tell you that it's the uh, inspector from East Hampton uh, gets paid a set amount per inspection and this is the number of inspections um, that we expect to conduct between now and the end of the fiscal year. Elsa Barley? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Rory, thank you, it's a good answer. Yeah. Uh, Rory, what, what's, the, what's the pleasure of the mayor for, for FY19? Is, is, are we going to have a plan inspector budgeted? Or are we gonna rely on- but No, we're, 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 we are budgeting for one. Um, we have posted, or we are gonna post the job and try to hire one. Um, there was a FMLA situation. I can't, probably can't talk too much uh, personnel issues to why the current inspector, unfortunately, we, we didn't want to lose him, uh, but beyond anybody's control, um, it's a personnel issue, so I don't think I can say much more than that. Um, so Damien has a set amount um, each year. Um, it's the same thing. The electrical inspector, we have an electrical inspector that gets uh, occasionally, if we need to, you know, our regular person on staff is on vacation. We need to pay somebody. Same thing with the building side. So there is a line within the expense side um, for contracted services, whatever it's actually called, for these different inspectors uh, that just kind of come in and help out as needed. Um, and so we want to hire somebody. It's, it's better for us to have somebody in-house. But even when we do hire somebody and have somebody in-house, there are certain times um, you know, it's an emergency situation, it's the winter, that boiler goes and somebody needs to go inspect to the, the new installation. But if our regular person is on vacation that week, we're not gonna tell that family that's in the cold, they're gonna have to wait until our person comes back. So we already have relationships with other inspectors that will come in and do those inspections. And the last thing is, is what's the balance of, of the line I'm in, in, in that 
at this point. So is it exactly four thousand dollars? No, no, it's 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 greater than four. I would imagine it's greater than four thousand dollars. I could okay. go find that information. I could go log in right now and find that information out if you'd like. But um, it's I imagine greater than four thousand um, dollars. This is just what Damien needs in that line uh, to get through the end of the fiscal year. Yeah, you know, maybe you don't have to log in now, but maybe if you wanted to send an email or something. Absolutely, like I'd be happy to do that, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Oh, so Tom. Yeah, also, I, I, Councillor Bailey made some good points. If if there is, for some reason, he uses 2,000 of this, and if sure. 2,000 left over yeah. in that line item, that would just go into the general fund. It goes to free cash, yeah. Yep. Free cash. It goes okay. to free cash, unexpended budget lines, just like any other unexpended budget line. All right, thank you. And if there are any other transfers proposed, unlike prior years with the new rulings it has to come before us yeah, anything that would yeah. go into those salary lines absolutely would have to go before you and i can also say that we're getting to the point in the fiscal year where any transfer that comes onto the mayor's desk uh, is scrutinized not that he doesn't scrutinize throughout the year but especially at this point because there has been a culture in the past uh with municipal budgets spend it or lose it um and and the mayor has done a really good job of clamping down on that um so any any transfer you know, really has to be justified um, at this point in the fiscal year. Rory, while you're standing there with that good auditor of ours behind you, yeah. to your right, um, I'm, I'm going to speak to the mayor, but I'd just like to uh, request uh, respectfully that by our June first Tuesday meeting in June, yes, all transfer requests and the new appropriations sure. are before us. So if they go to this committee, we'll have time to get them out for the final meeting in June. And if if we don't, there is no bets that anything sure. will be adopted on that final meeting yeah. that comes in that night. That shouldn't be a problem. We'll keep an open mind. Yep. Emergencies, but yep. if we can get everything in here, it would be really nice. Yeah, I remember a special meeting a few years back where it was like uh, right at the end of the fiscal year, and at that the current that that former council president yeah. shut it off uh, at, at a certain point. So we don't want a, a repeat of that for sure. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Any further discussion? The motion on the floor is to adopt or recommend to the Quill City Council to adopt the transfer. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Passes 5 to 0. 4 0. 4 0. It's going to be 5 eventually. It will be, hopefully. With our good administrative assistant, we'll mark it up. Uh, the next one we're waiting for Mike McManus. Actually, the next two we're waiting for Mike McManus. And then following, that would be items four and five. Items six and seven, and I know there's some people here to talk about it. We're just gonna give Councillor McGee a few minutes to uh, get off the highway and get here. So if we could, while we're waiting, we have two other items, but I'm gonna ask the committee to go out of order to the last item on the agenda, which is item number nine. Make a motion to suspend the rule. Uh, Take the motion up on item number motion nine. Make, motion made and second to suspend the rules to proceed out of order to item number nine. This is an order that is introduced by Councilor Bacon. Uh, this committee has met on it at least once in the past. And the order is that the Hoyoke Media Group and Corporation appear before the City Council to explain the use of cable and provide the City Council with legal documentation and authorizes the creation of this Hoyoke Media and a copy of organization corporate papers that the Hoyoke Media provide financial reports and an audit of the finances. Cable subscribers in Hoyoke are paying $5 per month in comparison to 57, 50 cents paid by subscribers in, subscribers in other towns. Many cable uh, customers are asking questions about the cable fees and the totals and the approximate what's going on with the money that has accumulated over, I, I guess when this was filed it was over a year, but it was over, it's over a couple of years now. Um, Motion is taken off the table for discussion. I'll move. Just to point out to the committee members, and I know Councillor Bartley knows this, and I think we all know this, that next Monday there is going to be a very general discussion with all the members of Hoyle uh, Media in with the DGR committee. This is some housekeeping with the Finance Committee, and, and our focus this evening is just to get the finances and the reports that this committee asked for last year. Um, there's an explanation why some of the finances are late coming and there's a good news I think from the city auditor in terms of some new uh, state statutes that are coming down the pike that's going to not only allow municipalities but kind of uh, sanction the municipalities to uh, have some oversight over these funds. So my suggestion tonight is that we don't deep too far into 
the, the questions about Holyoke Media and allow the good committee, DGR, to, to handle all that. But that we accept, we talked to uh, Scott McPherson is here from Holyoke Media. He is the title will be CEO? Executive, Executive Director. And our, of course our auditor, Bellamy Smith, is here also. And a motion to allow those two to come forward and to have a general discussion on the finances of this Hoyok Media. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Scott Bellamy, if you if you want to come in, might be might be easier with both of you. And anyone else that you want to bring in, Scott? I know. Oh, Indian. Indian, yeah. Indian sit down. Sit down. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, if it makes sense, we'll go with uh, Hoyoke Media first. Scott could walk us through, and again, Scott and I talked about this earlier, just the, uh, the finance parts of this and what has been presented to the committee. We have hard copies here. And then Bellamy, we can talk about, you can add anything, but we can talk about that new state uh, uh, language coming down the road and, and where it's at. Scott, if you can just give us a little summary of the packet here. Yeah, absolutely. What I what I brought to the council is um, copies of all of our state filings, our incorporation, the um, the documents that allowed the name change from the previous incarnation of this organization into Holyoke Media, the change in um, the board of directors. Um, and then in addition to that, there are um, profit and loss and balance sheets for 2017, profit and loss and balance sheet for the first quarter of 2018, um, and a budget for 2018. An audit is being conducted right now of the 2017 finances and will be forthcoming. Okay, Scott, who's doing the audit for you? Uh, it's Dave Morton. And just for the record, Dave Morton has been assigned to the PEG Access uh, group from the advent of the original PEG Access to the, as, as our former president um, explained to us, uh, to the advent of this uh, larger group, Oil Media, connected with the PEG Access and, and how that works. But I think that's something for next week, um, unless it's important to the finances here. Um, Scott, the reason this would be the first audit of Hoyoke Media, first annual audit? Yes. Okay. Of, of this incarnation of the organization, yes. Okay. Scott, you've also purchased a building through the uh, Heda Corporation, um, and I believe that building is in the midst of renovations? Correct. To adapt to what will that be? Our production studio and office spaces. Okay. Which would be, you know, the money spent there will be geared towards the public? Yes. Public use, I mean. Right? Yes, it will be a public building, yeah. Okay. I, I have not heard from Councillor Bacon, um, <laughs> but I, I think the, her order is clear, and, and I know it, it's, it's, I believe DGR is going to handle this um, a lot more in detail next week. But I, I believe that this is the information that we've been looking for. And if there's, is there any questions for Hoyoke Media in terms of the monies, finances, anything that's going on, what, you know, connected to the finances, what, you know, besides their agreement with the city, that, you know, they're under state statute and we can, we can come back to that. If I could just skip over to Bellamy. And Bellamy, this is the one that I think many of us have been concerned about is, is accountability is always important. And we understand that the money that comes into this uh, fund um, traditionally comes through the city, so to speak, because the mayor negotiates with the cable provider. Uh, the previous contract, it was a much smaller amount than the current contract. And the, the PEG Access Group, as we knew it, which originally was the president of the city council, the city solicitor, and the mayor, three people, Dave Morton was their, their hired uh, accountant, you know, took care of the monies, um, continuing, you know, at that, you know, from the beginning, and I believe it's going to continue, a portion of the monies is funneled to the Hoyoke Public Schools for their, their program, which at the current time is also 
doing a lot with public access, but I believe there's going to be a passing of the baton there down down the road. But you know, the uh, Holyoke Media, the last we talked to them, and and I believe the mayor has agreed that you know you know a portion of these monies will always go to the public schools. But accountability is what we can never get an answer to. Is what is the city accountable for, and how should the city you know oversee this money as it goes into the uh, the group itself? Could you enlighten us on <laughs> this new new uh, option coming from our our uh, good fathers down in uh, Boston? Yes, approximately two years ago, I'm going to say it was roughly January of 2016. Don't hold me to that exact. I know it was January. Which year? I'm not quite sure. Uh, the state issued a bulletin describing a new set of laws that they were adopting around the formation of special revenue funds for cable access monies. Um, I believe that the reason that PEG access was set up so long ago was because there was no state statute that, they, that the cable companies could follow at that time to give the city money as they, they did, so they just set up this PEG access. So this new legislation then provides an umbrella for the, the setup of a special revenue fund and various um, uh, means to organize the fund and how to deal with it and so forth. I was quite pleased to see this because when I first came across the PEG Access Fund, I thought, well, here's all this money that's sort of coming to the citizens of Oyoke that's not being audited by our auditors. And the whole purpose of the city is to have all the money in one place and have auditors verify that it's all being accounted for and so forth. So I called the state, um, the, our, our local DLS folks, to find out um, what do we have to do to put in place this, this um, special, uh, special revenue fund. Uh, their response was, hold your horses. We haven't quite figured it out yet, so don't do anything stay tuned, we'll get back to you and we'll tell you what to do. Well, they never got back to me, so some six to nine months later I called again and said, is there any news on this front? And they said, well, we're working on it, but, but still no news. And that was my last contact with them on this subject, which would have been uh, at least a year, maybe a year and a quarter ago. I haven't called them since I've been in this job more recently to see if there is an update, but I would be happy to do that um, and, and see if there's any news and, and get that back to you. Speaking for myself, I think for others, we, we appreciate that. Um, not only that the state's allowing it to happen, the original PEG access, when it was set up, there was, and you're correct, there was nothing to go by. And it actually um, was was a uh, almost a mirror of, of what the the good city town of Greenfield did um, to to put a, a, a uh, I think it's a 501c but put it you know into a form of a corporation that would allow things to happen but at the same time have have accountability um, accountability at that time you know was fairly easy this is much different you know we're going into into the million dollars instead of just the uh, you know the uh, eighteen thousand that came every quarter or so, or whatever the number was, and we do um, we do appreciate that. And, and I, I for one, believe that our our auditing department has to have a role in this down the road. So if you could let us know when that happens, we'll be glad to take whatever votes we need to do to put it in place. Is there any questions for the auditor, Council Lady? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted at this time disclose that my wife Eileen Brady Leahy does work for Comcast. Um, I'm just looking over this order now, and this order is looking for a few things. One is uh, it's the use of cable fees. Second thing is provide the council with legal documentation that authorizes the uh, creation of Hoyok uh, Media uh, and a copy of the organization corporate papers. Um, and looking over that, there is no conflict um, uh, with me. So I just want, however, I did want to disclose that. The uh, committee recommend, recognizes the disclosure. Any other discussion? Any other questions for Hoyoke Media? Yeah. Yes. Um, if I could just add um, that, that we've 
There's a there's a organization called Mass Access in the state of Massachusetts that is a membership organization of community media organizations around the state, and they've been back and forth with DOR about this auditing issue for some time. Um, and and I wanted to stress that the 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 point, the intention of DOR and everything that they've communicated to Mass Access is clarity for the city, so that the city can understand very easily what's going on in terms of how the finances flow to the community media center, and also to isolate that money from the city as they, the intention of the money is very specifically not to be in general in city general funds. And so um, I think it's just important for the, for the viewing audience at home to understand that um, you know, the allocation of money to an independent organization when the shift happened from um, the, the original Holyoke Media, when it was a PEG, PEG Media inside of Holyoke, that transition hasn't changed the intention of that money. You know, and we're, um, we're happy, I think, as an organization to really be very clear with the city on all these, all these points. Thank you. Anything else? Councilor Barley. Yeah. Um, tell me, what, what do we have for a balance at this point? Or does anybody know what, what our... Uh, there's a balance sheet in the documents that I gave you. Here, David, there's the next one. <clears throat> okay, so... Total bank accounts. So, it, so I look at your your balance sheet. Let me just. Let me, what do you have for cash on hand? So that's what I'm. Okay, and, hmm. Total bank accounts is one point eight nine million dollars. So. So why don't you just help me th through that, would you please, for a second? So if, this is, I say it's ending, it's ending December. So it's pretty brief, December, December 2017. Yeah, there's a Q1 for 2018 as well. Say that again, please. There's one from quarter one of 2018 as well. Oh, there is. I see it attached, yes. Here you have, well, this this is actually something we can sort of get ahead of for next week, I suppose. We can sort of try to get our arms around it. Um, Bellamy, the the, the 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 funds pass through the city. No, sir. No, they do not. They go directly to uh, Hoyt Media. Is that what it's called? Yes. No, so I do not see those funds. Okay, the funds go right from Con Comcast to, to Holyoke Media. Yes. Has that always been the case? Yes. Before Holyoke Meter was, was, was set up, it, it, the it, funds... It, it went to Peg Access. There was a little company called Peg Access. Right. And it went, it went to Peg Access. And they had their own bank account, and it had nothing to do with the auditor, which surprised me when I found out about it. And now this legislation you referred to, that's going to... Do what? Well, in simple terms, it will allow the city to set up a fund, uh, as we do for grants <coughs> or, or bonds or other things, into which all of this money is funneled, presumably, and then somehow managed by, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how they're planning for it to be managed, but presumably Holyoke Media would manage it, but the city would be auditing the process. Yeah, it's laying out the DOR um, rules that they're looking at right now um, establish two possibilities, one of setting up a special revenue fund or one of setting up an enterprise fund. But those rulings have been put off um, at least twice, if not three times now, while they're still trying to figure out the nuts and bolts of this. And, and, what, and what are Holyoke uh, subscribers? Short order says $5 per month, but that's, that's been changed. What are Holyoke subscribers paying now? So it doesn't work out to a specific dollar figure. It's a percentage basis. So the, the language in the order, for example, said neighboring communities are paying 50 cents. Um, I don't think it's really realistically possible that that is the amount that the neighboring communities are paying. It's, a f it's based on a percentage of the total cable revenues that are subscribed. There are um, 
paid for within a community. And so that um, <clears throat> if, for example, the television portion of your cable bill was $100, then you would be paying $5. $5. Um, but this speaks exclusively to the television component of that bill, not to the phone and not to the internet. So if you have, if you have uh, that whole bundle, you're paying more? It's, it scales based on whatever the amount of television service you're buying is. <clears throat> okay, and, and the, the, the use of, of the, you know, I'm just trying to get to her, her, her order and we'll, we'll get into mine next week. So I don't want to belabor this too much, but the, the, the use of the <clears throat> funds, um, so I see, in the first quarter, I see about um, $70,000 worth of expenditures, and, and I see a little south of that for, for uh, revenue. So your expenditures, are you the executive, you're the executive director, correct? Yes. And, and so are you, at this point, still the only paid employee? Uh, no, we've hired one additional employee. How many hours a week? Full time. Benefits? Yes. From the city or, or not? Not. And, and to be clear, we are a private nonprofit. Uh, I know. I, I, okay. I, I heard that. I'm just I'm just saying for the public too. I I, I know you're a, a private nonprofit, and, and I'll I'll take. And did you provide that to the to the committee the the, the information that you this thing you to incorporate? Yes. Yes. Did, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I don't. Okay. So I, I wasn't handed that, but I'll, I'm sure I will be soon. Thanks, Mike. Just through, let me just take a look at Linda's order real quick. So, oh, thank you, Bob, Mr. Chairman. Councilor no, Salvin. Yeah. So, Scott, I'm looking at the uh, articles of incorporation. Um, Got a, a president, treasurer. Um, who's the treasurer now? Uh, Dennis Lazuriaga. Okay, so none, none of this stuff is current then, right? Um, that charts the transition to the composition of the current board. Um, there's more information that we'll present at the next uh, at the meeting next week about um, the current board transitioning to a permanent board, which will also afford the city council, the mayor's office, and the school committee. Uh, the ability to appoint one member to that board. And that at that point in time, all those officers will be finalized and updated. Okay. So right now you're, you're sitting on 1.9 million in cash. What, what's the intended use of that cash? <clears throat> sure, a, a good chunk of that is gonna go into the renovation of the property that we just purchased. Um, you know, we need to purchase equipment. I mean, you know, walking in day one, we had ostensibly nothing. So purchasing equipment, purchasing facilities. Um, and then beyond that, there will be um, staffing and the associated costs. Okay, so, but this facility, the staffing, the costs are, are gonna provide what? Um, sure. So it's gonna be the kind of quick answer, and I'll, I'll speak at more length about this next week. Um, Quick answer is we're, we're an educational nonprofit, um, and so it'll be completely open to the public to come in and we'll provide training in the use of uh, the tools of video production as well as support in their use. Um, we'll also do a great deal around um, providing better access to government meetings and politicians in town, um, facilitating civic engagement, working, assisting in fostering arts and culture, assisting in marketing the community. Okay, but um, it, it looks like this thing's spinning off of, I mean, right now, just based on the January through March numbers, it's spinning off about an, ex an excess of $250,000 a year on top of that. And that's going to be on top of spending the $1.9 million in the bank renovating a facility? Uh, I'm sorry, are you asking? Because those documents should show money that's been spent currently, but also, I mean, so there's two, 
this money is coming in um, ongoing so that our operational costs each year will be um, you know in the ballpark of, of uh, probably 350 or four hundred thousand dollars I would guess um, the renovation costs are coming more directly from that capital pool of cash uh, that should be listed out in there Yeah, that's, that's all I've got for right now. Any further discussion? Gentlemen, I want to thank everyone. Um, Councilor McGee has joined us. Um, we have a couple options with this, knowing what's going to happen in DGR, which I think will be more detailed about a lot of things in terms of operations and, and things that we've heard, but more important that we get updated on it, I believe, will happen next week. Um, this does comply with the order, but and I, and I think we might be better off waiting, I mean, letting the City Council know that the original order has been complied with and then we'll file some new orders when the uh, state allows us to get into that uh, that oversight. Does that make sense, Bellamy? Okay. So I'm not sure if there's any other questions. Chair, to take a motion. Motion that the uh, order has been complied with. Motion made a second. The order has been complied with with the information that's been provided by Hoyoke Media and the information that we received from the auditor this evening. If there's no other discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. So moved. <coughs> We're, um, while Councilor McGee is settling in, we also, I also note that our superintendent of the DPW is with us. So if we can get back to uh, the order of the agenda, which would be item number four. So we'll take it off the table Aye. for discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? This is introduced if, that the amount of $20,000 be transferred from Tree Climber and put into contract services. Uh, under discussion, Mr. Uh, McManus, it's a pleasure to see you. And if you could just walk us through what this is. I know it's the Forestry Department, which comes under your domain, but what, what's, uh, what's this all about? So last fiscal year, uh, we kind of changed the way we were doing tree removal. Previously, we had always gone out to bid and hired a, a service to remove trees that the city forester wouldn't be able to get to himself. Uh, and we thought it might be prudent to take some of those funds and create a new position, a tree, tr tree climber position uh, for a city employee to, to help and uh, instead of just take trees down, also um, prune, prune uh, and do uh, uh, stump grinding and, and other forestry related tasks. Uh, we've we've had this position open <coughs> and advertised and we haven't had any applicants. Uh, so at this time we're, we're late in the fiscal year. Um, we did have some limited budget for tree removal services which we've expended what this would be is a transfer from the uh, personnel side to the expense side so that we can increase their purchase order and do some more tree removal. Okay. Okay. Michael, I think every city councilor here and every city councilor not here understands that out there somewhere, there's a list that's got to be <coughs> at least 107 pages long of needed uh, work on trees. Is There's such a list of uh, everything that's been filed over the years, knowing that there's only so much can be gotten to in one year. And, or is it something that's updated every year and do you update by priority or by the way it comes in? So there really isn't a list, uh, at least written down on paper. The uh, city forester has a working list. He knows in his head, uh, he knows where the problematic trees are and he takes those down as, as funds are available. And, and what this would do is, it, give us another three weeks worth of time for a Splenda to come in and, and remove trees. And they generally do about one tree per day. In a perfect world, with a budget unlimited and a staff unlimited, how much work is out there? Uh, it'd probably be several months. Any discussion? Councilor Barley? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm 
mic. Um, so uh, when you were going to hire, you were going to hire somebody last year, but th you didn't have any money in, in the budget at the start of the year. That was my recollection. So, so now you have money in the budget, or potentially money in the budget. So why are we? Um, I mean, I, I guess I mean we, we use contractors all the time. I mean, let me rephrase it. Are, are, are we going to try to budget for this for next fiscal year? This position. That, that's the intent. Yes, the intent is we hopefully can find somebody, somebody out there would be willing to work at the city of Holyoke as a tree climber. Uh, the the budget was funded. Um, just. And uh, I know the, the personnel department uh, did advertise this position. They've put it out there. They haven't done the Hello Holyoke yet. We should. We should. Um, but we just, we have not got a single application. If you know anybody who has a tree removal experience. Uh, there's some thought that the requirements that we had might have been too stringent for the pay that we were offering. Uh, the requirement to be able to operate an aerial lift might be above the pay grade that the city was willing to to, to offer. Well, what is the city offering? Uh, I believe it's around forty-three to forty-five thousand. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Councilor Solomon. Yeah. Mike, uh, Craig, uh, for an aerial lift operator, is that a uh, Class 1C license, something like that? That's a... Uh... I know we, we have the... It's a Class C and a Class A. Because yeah. the... So the aerial lift is one one component, but other other trucks that we have would require a Class C. Well, as far... Not, not the driver's license, but the... The aerial license, that's a crane operator's license, Correct, I believe, yeah. right? So that would be a 1C. Okay. Okay. Um, I, th I think that's uh, what our problem is going to be going forward. Somebody with a Class 1C license and that experience is probably making $70,000 a year. That's that's my hunch. So we can advertise this till the cows come home. I don't think we're going to see anybody. And, you know, just for the rest of the council and the public, it, and if we keep on, you know, uh, trying to do it through contract services, that prevailing wage, we're going to get absolutely nowhere. We're not going to make any progress with this. So I, I guess I'm singing to the choir, but I want I want everybody to understand this as we go forward. Any further discussion, Councilor Councilor Leahy? Yeah, thank you, Michael, for coming down here tonight and discussing this. I just had two questions. One is, uh, um, um, so. The forester now is kind of just doing it off memory. You said, so does he get the orders that we file? So say if uh, Jim Lay files an order, and um, I say, you know, there's a street, on, uh, there's a tree on Main Street that's hanging over, and it's it's going to be it's going to be, you know, it's dangerous. Um, the order gets, you know, Brian gets it, the mayor gets it, you get it. Now, do you forward those orders down or to the uh, forester? Yes. Okay. So he gets a copy of all of the orders, uh, any emails that come to me, I forward to him uh, anything through C Click Fix, or if somebody calls the Department of Public Works, it gets forwarded to him. Uh, people write in requests for tree removal to the Board of Public Works, that also gets forwarded to him. Okay. All right. So he does get notified. So, um, the second thing is uh, do we have any inspectors that go out and watch the contracted service services? For instance, uh, on uh, Cleveland Street, for instance, um, there was a lot of tree work that was done, and these uh, these people, in my opinion, I'm not, I'm not gonna say for certain, seem to be dropping the tree branches and kind of just ruining the guardrail that was there. And if you, if you drive down Cleveland Street, it just, uh, this guardrail is just mangled. Um, so do we have anybody that's overseen any of this? Uh, not full-time. Uh, certainly we would meet with them, tell them, which trees need to be removed, uh, we, and then we, there would be spot inspections. Do we go after um, any company that um, you know, uh, you know, damages uh, any anything in the city? Like for instance, like a guardrail. We would, yeah. Okay. 
have we gone after anybody on the Cleveland Street? No. Oh, okay. Thank you. Councilor McGee. Um, there is a list because when I took over for finance and Bill was here, he used to have a folder and you just pull them out of a folder. And we said, that's nonsense. Some of those trees aren't even there anymore. So it was put into the computer and a list was provided of the top trees. And then we slowly started eating away at them. Um, we have trees out there, uh, a tree that fell on a car, um, on, was it, uh, Wellesley? Wellesley. That, that trunk is still standing there. Are you cutting that one down? Or is it just going to be a dead tree standing there? No, the intent would be to cut the trunk down. When? Because the constituents I, keep calling me. I don't have a timeline. Yeah, that's the problem. Putting 43000 for a job that's never going to be filled and then cherry picking from it for contract services really makes no sense to me. So we're going to take 20 out of this. And you said it was 43. Did we use the other 23 on something else? or No. Okay, so why don't we just go for the full 43? Um, at the time, there was still, at the time that the request was made, there was still time within the fiscal year. So we hadn't had one applicant? No, we hadn't. But if we were to take all of the money away, then there wouldn't be anything to hire anybody with. Not one applicant? How long have you been advertising? Yeah, uh, 10 months. Yeah, that, and I have trees, I have a list of trees I keep filing orders on. Nothing's happening to them. So either we get a program in place or uh, I can honestly say budget-wise, I know what I'm going to be going after to take out of the budget, just being right up front. Thank you. Any further discussion? To entertain a motion. Make a motion to uh, pass the transfer. Motion made second, second to uh, pass to recommend adoption of the transfer to the full city council. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Item passes four to one. Mike, while you're here, we have uh, item number five. We'll take it off the table for discussion. Second. It's a request that the city apprise the uh, city council of the status of repairs, including the collection mechanisms at the Thank two you. parking garages, the Mayor Proof Garage and the Mayor Topier Garage, as well as provide contract information on the new parking vendor. Under discussion, uh, Mr. McManus is handing out information. Would you like to walk us through where we are? Sure. So the Starting with the, the second part, the contract information on the new parking vendor, Executive Parking is the vendor that the city's contracted with. Um, then they operate the garages, the lots, and the on-street parking, where the meters are at least. So their, their contract requires them to maintain the grounds, which is uh, any mowing or landscaping that needs to be done, collect litter and rubbish within the garages and the lots. Uh, minor parking repairs, which would include sweeping or painting or replacing light bulbs inside the garages. Uh, their contract requires them to do any maintenance work with a value of $500 or less. Uh, and then collect the monthly payments and uh, administer the monthly system. So. The, uh, they would they maintain all of the accounts and the cards and the activate and deactivate cards as needed uh, And then they also collect and deposit the transient and the on-street parking meter revenue for the city They have a one-year contract that started last fiscal year their annual fee is a hundred and twenty thousand two hundred and seventy dollars uh, and then there's a, a running summary of uh, revenue per garage, uh, so the, which is in the, uh, the attached sheet for the last few years. So this fiscal year today, the revenue is, is around $283,000. If we project that out, uh, it would be a little bit more than $340,000 for the fiscal year. And we had budgeted a revenue of $313,000. On that second sheet, uh, there's a breakdown 
by category of where the revenue comes from with the Dwight Street and the Suffolk Street garages. And then there's a, a number of small lots around the downtown area. And it also has the, the street meters. Revenue has been increasing. If we look at uh, year on year for the last few years. Most of the revenue comes from the, the monthly uh, parking at uh, Dwight and Suffolk, and then also the on-street parking meters. Well, currently there is no revenue for right. off-street parking daily because we're not able to collect it. At the Suffolk Street parking garage. Dwight. Is Dwight Street still shut up? For, for transient, but we have monthly parking. No, I understand. There's monthly parking at both, and monthly parking is important. Right. But there are people who don't need monthly parking but need more than two hours at a meter. But if you look uh, historically, the monthly, the transient parking at Dwight Street and Suffolk Street has been uh, minimal compared to the monthly parking. I mean, it, it, it's averaged around uh, six to $8,000 per garage per year. And, and I do understand that, and we did correct that with our rate increases, but the issue isn't just revenue. The issue is the need for daily parking for people who work in the courts not five days a week, but come in two days a week. Correct. For people who work at the health center not five days a week, but come in one or two days a week for people who want to spend the entire day downtown shopping, lunch, and so forth, where they'd have to move their car out of a meter every two hours, that daily parking was designed as a comprehensive plan for the entire downtown to have both for the Children's Museum for when they're having events or you know people that are taking their children to the Children's Museum during the week, the Volleyball Hall of Fame. It's all needed in the scheme of parking for a vibrant downtown. Which kind of goes into the second part of the order with the status of the repairs because the the pay stations for both parking garages are are down for the transient for those daily parkers uh, the they were both vandalized um, in two thousand and sixteen and we we paid a little over seventeen thousand dollars to have them repaired then a few months later they were vandalized again. Uh, we had uh, the, the vendor who provided the equipment in the first place come out and give us a, an estimate on what it would cost to fix them back in August and they said it would be around $83,000 to fix these machines so that they, we could accept the daily payments. Uh, we said that's way too much, uh, can we do something different? They came back the next month and the cost was uh, 68000 and we've been continuing trying to work with them, and finally we're we're at a place where they're saying for uh, a little over twenty five thousand dollars they can fix these two machines so that they'll they'll take payments. But twenty five thousand dollars is is a lot of money to pay for a machine that really only generates eight thousand dollars in revenue a year. We're looking at is it is it worth fixing these machines or is there another option that we can put out there for these daily um, these daily workers and those would include uh, like a multi-space parking meter where you would go and put in your license plate number and get a ticket put that in your in your windshield. There's also systems that uh, recognize license plates and can generate a, a ticket based off of that. Uh, the newer machines would be able to take credit cards. They'd be able to have a mobile app for payment, um, which would you know reduce the amount of of cash that would be in these machines and and reduce the likelihood of vandalism in the future. And then there's also the um, the twenty five thousand dollars that hasn't been budgeted for maintenance in these garages, and it's locating a place where that money is so that we can move forward 
with the repair. Chair is going to recognize the maker of this order, which is Councillor Bartley. David, did you want to add anything before? Uh, we yeah, keep I, and to the to the just the chair. And yeah, normally that's normally that's what happens. The chair will refer it, but Joe and I have this <laughs> same passion about this parking, <laughs> so I, I wasn't surprised. And and just to show you how how into it I am, Joe, I I, I know I filed a similar order that says like we just floated over the ordinance. Uh, a couple months ago, so we'll we'll probably revisit it in ordinance at some point, uh, Mike. When the chair lady wants to take that up, so um, yeah, Mike, you, you just wear a lot of hats, and so I, I I want the the public to know how much I respect and admire your work that you do. So uh, I I just there's just too many things that you, that your your job oversees way too many things. Uh, so from and, and, and I get other counselors' frustration because um, I, I had the same frustrations too I, I, uh, about about day-to-day uh, -day things. That, I mean, from trash to trees to, to, to parking to um, bridges, uh, it, it just roads, asphalt, it goes on and on and on and on. So, um, but here we are with the situation. Uh, is Rory still here? Oh, good, okay, so, and, and, and so I, I, I I mean, uh, Mr. Chairman, we just have a very frustrating situation set up. So if I, if I look at this contract here, uh, vandalism is not covered in the parking agreement contract. All right. Now, I, you know, we, we all know that we have Springfield. They run parking garages with, with meters, I'm mean, with, uh, with, with the arm bar going up and down. It seems to work every day when I go there. Northampton. They run with the armbar arm bar every day. Seems to work when I go there. New Haven. Now, New Haven is not a crime-free city. Somehow, that parking garage with the armbar works every day when, you when I take the train and see my sister. So, <laughs> I mean, what's the position of the mayor's office on this? I mean, this is not, this is not really, uh, shouldn't be on the shoulders of the DPW superintendent who's running every other job in this city other than police and fire, it seems like. Um, you know, so I, I would really, you know, if we don't do it here, we'll, we'll, we'll do it and uh, we'll, we'll have it done in ordinance, but um, I mean, Mike, there, there's just gotta be, I mean, there, there are templates out there. So what, why, aren't, why aren't we using them? And we are, we're trying to find a, you know, a viable solution for this problem. We meeting you or we meeting you in the mayor, mayor's office? Okay, I assume. Right, no, the mayor's yeah, office sure. is, is involved. Uh, we discuss this frequently. And, and not just parking at the garages, but also the on-street parking and all of the, the nuances involved with that. So when vandalism isn't covered, um, who, who, so somebody smashes in, uh, you know, John Doe's uh, windshield, what does John Doe do in the, in the in the Peru parking deck? Uh, and so, if if there's vandalism in the Peru parking deck, uh, it's it's not covered by the city. It's on that person to uh, pay for the repair of their their window, and they might go through their insurance to. See so if they're, that's they're they're a monthly parker, and they paid their fee, and. But, the, but is yeah. there something on there that says you, you park at your own risk? You're correct. Yeah. And this has happened uh, within the last few months where somebody's car was damaged by presumably another parker uh, hitting the vehicle. Um, but they, they are not covered by the city. One second, Joel. Okay, so, so the way you put it to me is we, we have, you, you've beaten them up down from 83,000 to 25,000 to, to fix the machines. But, but the whole time you've known that there was 8,000 annual revenue. So this has been going on since uh, 2016 at some point. I'd say uh, August of 2017 is the last time that the machines were vandalized and that, that's when they went down. 
previously in August, uh, uh, well, not, maybe not August of 2016, but in 2016, uh, when they were vandalized, uh, we had a mono come out and we paid them a little under $18,000 to fix the, fix the stations. And then, you know, within a year, they're broken gotcha. into again. All right, uh, can, can you give us a, a sense as to when we're gonna make a, a decision with, with the mayor's office and yourself as to the next generation of parking? Uh, so I had a meeting with a, a vendor last week uh, about the two parking garages. They're working on a, a proposal for a parking solution just at the garages, and uh, I should get that by this Friday. So I think uh, after that, um, we should be able to decide whether or not we move forward with repairing these uh, existing pay stations or if we would look to try to buy some new infrastructure to replace them all together. All right, and what's the thinking on, on, on revenue source for this, for, for making purchases? Are you going to have free cash? Or are you going to have to come back to city council? What, what, what do you, what well, it depends on how much it costs. Um, if, to, if there's some room within our existing budgets to do it, uh, we would we would look there first. But then, otherwise, it would be free cash. Right. And just just an aside, uh, uh, Joe. I, I think at the last meeting we, we said we were going to get a free cash update for tomorrow night. I, I believe we said that at the last um, last city council meeting. I think we we discussed that on the mic. Yes. Okay. So the auditor is here, and it's, well, I mean, it's always I, a good question. Well, just. You know, no, I'm, gonna, I'm putting you on the spot tonight, Joe, no, just, just a reminder. You're not, you're not, you're not yeah. at all, because no. I think it's a fair question, especially this time of year. Tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's three orders in the hopper, more or less. Two which are, uh, one which is on the agenda this evening here, one that the City Council recently passed. Um, depending on what happens with the IT order this evening and another order for $1,000, the amount of free cash would be at 91600 uh, depending on those two orders. So uh, actually, without those two orders, regardless of what happens to them, you know, if they don't pass, it goes back into that figure. Tell me, correct me. <laughs> uh, yeah, Can you speak in the microphone for the people at home? All right. Well, we'll 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 get we'll get the number tomorrow. So. The ninety-one and eighty-nine. All right, and then just the last one, uh, Mike. Um, the, the the meter heads. Uh, that does. What's the update on on meter heads? The, the on-street parking? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, just for those at home, um, that's just my shorthand for the on-street parking has a lot of, quite a number of poles, and I'm sure you can quantify it, or the, uh, the contract that can quantify how many poles are out there uh, in total, and then how many have a meter head on it so people can have to pay, and how many are without, so people just kind of park there all day. So. And so I don't have those numbers with me. Um, we can get it from when we meet in Ordens. Okay. So I don't need that now, Mike. But what's the update on the um, starting, you know, trying to, there's, there's scores of them there. I mean, I don't think I'm, well, dozens. There, there are just poles without a. Uh, so the, the, the meter heads are, are old. Um, and we do have a, a stock of, of meters. It, and that is within uh, executive parkings contract to take meter heads out, service them as, as they can, um, and also uh, replace within our stock any any meters that have been damaged or stolen. Well, that's that's good news. Uh, so when are they going to do it? I'm glad it's in the contract. That's you know that sounds like a reasonable provision in a contract that they are doing the parking and yeah. they should have. You know, take care of the meter heads. So they've been kind of. I'll have been, to. They've been headless horsemen for uh, for months and months. I'll have to get back to you at the. I like the that line, I just came up with that now. So yeah, the, the yeah. So the headless horsemen are in the in the dozens. 
I'll get back to you with the schedule if that's okay. Yeah, I, I, at some point we'll, we'll deal with an ordinance. And I mean, Joe, I really appreciate you taking this up. And uh, you know, you can probably just call it um, you know complied with and move, move, move it on, and, and we'll we'll take it up in ordinance again. But we'll have a little summary for tomorrow night. Okay, Councilor Leahy. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so right now to kind of um, um, tag on to uh, Councilor Bartley's last remarks. So right now, executive parking are responsible for changing out those heads, yet they're, they're not doing that. So essentially, they're not living up to their uh, end of the bargain uh, contract. You know, and I'm just trying to think of uh, lost revenue to the city. So the fact that you know we're losing revenue, and yet they're not doing their part of the contract. Um, you know, soon there should be, should we be getting some sort of money in return for that, some sort of consideration? Yeah, that's quite possible. Yes. So, how but I, I don't think there's there's nothing in the contract that says you have to maintain uh, the, the meter heads within you know a certain period of time, or else we're going to come back at you for lost revenue. Why? I mean, shouldn't there be? Not. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, it's it's good for them. It's bad for the city. I mean, just think of how um, how much. Uh, how much revenue uh, do we have any uh, I, could, I could come up with an estimate can you please do it um, and also I was kind of to uh, echo um, what two other counselors had said as well I mean I was just making a list here you're responsible for trash you're responsible for roads sewer um, parking the city's buildings uh, coming into these meetings uh, I mean I've, I I can't think of any other department head that has more on their plate than you um, so you know I, I want the people at home to know that um, but Councillor McGee and I had filed an order um, regarding the, the Prue uh, uh, parking garage a long time ago. And um, one of the things that's it's affecting is, you know, city's tourism. Uh, if people are coming in and trying to have um, a birthday party at the Children's Museum or going to the Volleyball Hall of Fame or the merry-go-round, and uh, there's essentially no parking, uh, two things could happen. One is they're not going to go in, and, and secondly, uh, they're not going to come back. Um, so that is not only lost revenue for the city of Hoyoke, but it's also lost revenue for uh, these nonprofits that, you know, really um, uh, need to get every penny they can to, uh, to function. And these are essentially um, some great nonprofits that we need, um, we need for them to be running successfully. So what, what is the, when will that be up for a daytime when people can essentially go there and, and park for two hours? I don't know. I mean, I, there's no way for for them to do it right now. We're working on a solution, and I'm not at a point where I can give you a date okay. that as of this day and time it will be up. Now, do we have a copy for the executive part? Uh, do we have a copy of their contract? Uh, the city does. And so maybe I can call the law department and get a copy of that? Correct. So I'd like to read that over. Um, and how often do we go out for contract with them? So it's a, an annual contract with uh, two one-year extensions. And do we also have any money um, set aside for uh, putting cameras up? We don't. Sh shouldn't we maybe uh, look to do that as well? If it's been vandalized twice, uh, what you said 2016 and, and 17, we should put, you know, put some sort of safeguards in there. And that has been an ongoing conversation with Gas and Electric on what the cost would be for putting cameras. So they would uh, I have charged. not gotten anything back from them as to this is the cost, but they were looking into, uh, you know, installing the cameras, the conduit, and where all of that video would go back to. Okay, thank you. Like I just can't say or, or I could repeat but I just can't say enough of what Councillor Bartley said is I mean you have inherited inherited a mess here and we understand that um, but the solutions um, are costing the whole the big picture a lot of money and I, I don't know if we have the answer the ordinance committee has talked about the creating of a parking authority under the DBW for the purposes of getting rid of the contract and perhaps going back to managing this whole thing ourselves. I mean, I, I would only be in favor of that if we could see some hard numbers. The, the numbers before us are foundation numbers, but they got a crack in the foundation. 
not only was there vandalism last year, which is why the, the, me the meters are down, the um, parking uh, mechanisms are down in both of the larger decks, but there was vandalism for both of those, or at least one of them, in prior years where they were down for lengthy periods of time. Before you took over, I told your predecessor that the former, and before um, the uh, uh, valet parking uh, contract ran up, they were not managing the daily parking correctly. They, they were closing down, or should I say, opening up the gates at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, letting people that had been there you know, for the course of the day go out without paying. And, and they did that, and it just seemed to get earlier and earlier where it used to be those gates were in operation until six o'clock at night. Um, it, it's, there's no easy answer, but no answer is, is not the way we, we have to approach it either. We need to, to get the revenue in source. If you look back on your numbers, back to early 15,000, 15, 2015, the, the money coming in on, on uh, one of the decks was more like between 15, uh, and, and 1,500 and 2,000 monthly. And, and I think if you go, if you ever went back before that, you will see that there was actually more transient parking dollars. And don't forget that that's the old rate. We have a new rate now, which <coughs> has been implemented. It is by ordinance, but it hasn't been used yet because the mechanisms have been down since we adopted the new ordinance. It's also with the monthly parking where you're citing better numbers is we, we doubled the parking fee from $20 to the monthly parking rate from $20 to $40. So there, there's a lot to be talked about, and I think David's right. You know, I hope we can work with you in the ordinance committee, and, and if we have to rewrite the ordinance, but the, uh, the big picture is not just revenue is important, but the big picture is also for the, uh, the future of downtown and all the good things that are happening. We have to accommodate them, like any downtown community, with reasonable parking and, and accessible parking. Councilor Barley? Just one last one, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, we, we did change that ordinance, Mike. Which one? Which? The parking ordinance, which we're, we're referring. So right. we, we changed all the parking rates and right, yeah. no, for the on yeah. street. And, and this was last year, right? Right. Yep. Right. And it has been implemented in the uh, garage. Okay. Great, yeah, the garage, but the but the the, the end of the street. I mean, we're we're still punting dimes. And that's kind of goes back to the on street parking technology that we have. No, I, there's no way you can answer that now. But I just want you to add that to your okay. add that to your list. So, so you, the, the the good nice thing about this order, I'm sorry, I'm repetitive, and I really appreciate the chairman taking it up. I I forgot I filed this actually, uh, which is not surprising, but. The, the, the chair lady of ordinance will take it up again. So now you've got all the issues that I really want to discuss at, at hand. So hopefully we'll get a better update or, you know, you'll have, you'll have more information for us at the next meeting. Any further discussion? No. Councilor Dahl. Yeah, thanks for coming down, Mike. And I know you got a lot on your plate and we're discussing this tonight. Um, you know, it, it's just based the stuff, stuff that I think you have to work with the mayor and his office and try to get something done because, you know, you realize, we all realize here, the money's being lost, you know, and of course it costs money to make money. You know, I know you gotta weigh out the cost. Do we get new machines? Do we get, you know, a new contract? You know, all that's gotta be thought out. But as the months go on, it's just more and more time that the city is getting in the hole because of the, you know, the cost. A gentleman stood here the other, uh, about a month ago and said that, you know, people are just parking there. They're just parking there and parking their cars there on the, on the deck on Suffolk Street, you know, for nothing or before you, you know, look at 2015 and the money that was coming in. So I, I just hope that in time, and it, and it doesn't take too long, that we get some kind of resolution here that we can start making the, the decisions to get this done and, and not delay it any longer. But thanks for your work. If there's no further discussion, the chair would suggest that this order has been complied with, knowing that the ordinance committee is working on the bigger picture with the ordinance that looks at the entire downtown parking uh, uh, prospects. I'll second that motion. Any discussion? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Mike, thank you. And, uh, thank you, sir. We understand. Keep up the good work, please. Furry, either way, you're next. 
Um, looking around, is there anyone here for Councillor McGee's IT question besides you? Uh, I have documentation. No, but there's no one else here. And I take it everybody else here is for the for the insurance. So if I can make a suggestion to the uh, to the committee, Roy, you're here for both, that we jump uh, jump over six and go right to Councillor McGee's order, item number seven. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Did the City of Hoyoke study and address the possibility of shifting the employees and retirees into the Commonwealth Group Insurance Health Insurance? Take it off the table for discussion. All those in favor? Any opposed? So moved. Rory and anyone, you can stay where you're sitting. If you want to come forward, you're all welcome. And uh, we just suspended the rules to allow anyone to speak if they so wish to on this item. Councillor McGee, did you want to say anything as maker of the order? Start there. So in addition to myself, um, and I'm here because um, in my capacity in the mayor's office uh, for the past four years I've been working um, uh, in the negotiations with Section 19, um, which is a group of all the unions, uh, representatives of all the unions, um, when we negotiate health insurance, it's kind of a two-sided negotiation. We work with our brokers to find a carrier and then negotiate a rate with the carrier, but then at the same time negotiate um, uh, in good faith with all the collective bargaining units uh, in the city. I should also note that uh, HG&E, uh, the water department, um, are also part of our health insurance system. Um, so when uh, I saw this and Joe had reached out, I suggested I'd, I could talk with our brokers. So we've got Steve Corbin from Rosh Insurance. We have Kirk Mackey uh, from Dowd Insurance. Uh, in the audience, we have Hector, uh, our new personnel director, uh, Maureen Ross O'Connell from Ross, and then Quentin Dunahue uh, and Joe, uh, both members of the Section 19. Are you here for Section 19 too, Jose? No. I'm just here, just hanging out, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing better to do on a Monday night. <laughs> I'm sorry, Steve, your last name? Our last name is Corbin, C-O-R-B-I-N. Thank you. Roy, do you want to lead us into it, or is there a plan? Or Yeah, I mean, I can, right I, what I can say is that, you know, we do take a look um, at the GIC um, every year. Um, we did an analysis, you know, there's a lot of changes going on with the GIC. Um, so where we're at right now, we've just renewed uh, for a second year with Cigna. Uh, they're our health insurance provider, they're a national network. Um, there are four options, um, a 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 deductible uh, plan, and then a, a 1,000 PPO plan, uh, which is a very expensive plan, um, that, but there are a small number of subscribers that still uh, choose to go with that. Uh, that's all with Cigna. For our retirees, if we were to move uh, to GIC, our retirees would also have to move. Um, right now, we, are ha we have a Blue Cross Blue Shield MedEx plan. It's only one option. It's a really great option, actually. Uh, very low co-pays, um, practically no deductible. Um, so it's, it's a good benefit for our retirees. Um, so with that, uh, a lot of the technical stuff, um, I would say that Steve and Kirk uh, could address. Uh, you know, there's a lot of history between the two here working with the city for a number of years um, and working with other groups and, you know, being very familiar with the GIC. Thank you. Kirk, Steve. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I just, you know, wonder if there were any particular questions or concerns that you had. Um, you know, because the, the analysis to move to the GIC is something that Kirk and I um, perform, perform along with the city each and every year. Um, and up until um, last year, it was actually required by the state that we file, that the city file a report to the state um, with those findings. Um, so it was just something that typically we, we perform that analysis after the initial enrollment is, is completed. The uh, plan year renews on July 1st. Uh, so typically we wait till after July 1st to look at those numbers. Um, so we can see where the enrollment falls. Um, each year it's a, it's a difficult process to do because you've got to work on a lot of assumptions 
Um, we got to assume where enrollment's going to fall. Um, majority of the folks, um, you know, we believe are going to want to be in a, a more broader network, which is why the, the city's typically offered um, a Blue Cross plan, which provides coverage throughout the, the state, as well as a local option with Health New England. Um, that was until last year, moving over to Cigna, which provided that national network. Uh, so when, when we do the analysis, it, it typically, again, it's, it's a huge range that we look at. I mean, you get a, wor a best case scenario, worst case scenario, and more times than not, it, it just works out that the, the city's doing everything um, in their power to keep costs um, as low as possible with the carriers they have. I know that the, you know, with the cooperation of the, the city and the unions that we've seen over the years, um, they've been able to make you know, some, some significant changes overall to, to keep those costs down. So um, without getting into too much detail, I guess I'd, I'd probably open it up to questions and, and see what questions and concerns that you may have. Kurt, did you want to add anything? No, not at this point. I just, uh, we've, we've put a lot of time into putting together some preliminary numbers here. Like Steve said, you know, we have to make certain assumptions here. We, we generally like to see where the enrollment falls. Um, you know, as you may or may not know, the GIC is, uh, you know, it's been in the press quite a bit over the course of the last three to six months especially. But, um, you know, as we look at it each year, you know, something changes with the GIC. So um, I think it's important that we hear from you, you know, what, what exactly you're looking for as far as information from the GIC. Uh, Ask a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, for coming down. Um, uh, what's the difference between our insurance in the city of Hoyle for our employees and uh, Springfield, who I guess just recently went to GIC? I mean, the, the, GIC, the difference between our insurance and their insurance from the perspective of what's available to them? Or yeah, yeah just, uh, just a couple of employees I was talking to, they were saying they were paying uh, less in premiums than their uh, spouses who... Uh, should say spouse, one person has a girlfriend. Um, their significant other that li works in Hoyoke. And so they're comparing their costs to uh, employees. Are you talking like they have a single rate and a double rate and a family rate, or are they just- They both have, have single rate? rates. And the, I guess Springfield, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, went to the GIC plan and this person, um, th their premium or their uh, cost per month went down from what they had and is paying less than the, uh, the Hoyoke police officer. Right. So we have we have a single and family option as far as anybody that's in the active plan is concerned. We look at that three tier option every year to see if it's economical. And you know, in the past seven or eight years that we've been involved in this, um, that that equation has not worked out. Uh, what, you know, what happens there is, you know, you take a single rate and a, and a family rate. If you if you take a double rate, an employee and spouse, it moves the family rate out further. So. The single people don't really see any impact. The people that are just a couple see a very nice savings. People that have a family who can generally at least afford it are the ones that uh, end up, you know, costing them more. Yeah, and um, that's true too. And as you're saying that, I'm also thinking uh, the city of Hoyoke pays what percentage of the uh, of the insurance? It it varies. Very each plan each is plan different. is different. Okay, because I'm thinking um, that's so probably the, so. Like at the state level, for example, state employees and GIC. Um, pretty much across the board, uh, the state picks up 80% um, and the, the employee picks up 20%. So if you looked at a just, you know, I, when I worked at the state house, I was on that. I came to Holyoke, I paid a little bit more. Um, but that's just what's getting taken out of my check each week. Now, obviously, there's a greater expense to the, to the state, to the employer in that case. But um, this year, for example, um, because they just released their plan design, um, you know, if, if you're a City of Holyoke employee, um, you're going to pay $20 to see your primary care physician, $25 to see any other type of doctor, specialists, you know, so on and so forth. If you were in the GIC, uh, you'd be paying $20 for your primary care, but you could be paying anywhere between $30, $60, or $75 each visit for a specialist. Um, now, if you think about, um, you know, some of these folks that need to see you know, specialists on a regular basis, you know, that $75 versus the $25 copay is going to add up real quick. Same thing when it comes to prescription. Right now, uh, and this is something that is always very important, um, you know, uh, to, the, to the folks in the unions. Um, so the way it works right now is you have uh, 10, 20, 35. That's the, that's the tier 
for your prescription. You go pick up your script at Walgreens, 30 day supply of penicillin or whatever it is. For folks that are on mail order, um, where you actually get a 90 day supply, uh, it's the same price, 10, 20, 35. If you were at the GIC, you'd be paying anywhere between $10 and $65 for that regular trip to Walgreens, your regular over-the-counter 30-day supply. If you were, um, if you were going to do um, uh, mail order, that goes $25.75, $165 for a 90-day supply. And that, that includes the retirees. Um, the, those, those are the co-pays across the board. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard to do and this is one of the things that I've, I've always pressed, you know, the brokers, and I've learned a lot, um, you know, about this is, um, you know, if, if you talk to the person in Springfield or you talk to the person that works at the state or maybe another community that has GIC, it's, it, you can't really do an apples to apples. We could say the co-pays are going to be the same thing across the board, but as far as what the premiums would be for the city, because what they do is they take a look at our experience um, and... You know, I, I will say that you know we, we have a population in the city. Uh, the pharmaceutical costs um, are, are what's driving these increases. And when you have, you know, five to ten people needing to take uh, one type of medicine that costs four hundred thousand dollars a year, that's going to drive that up. And that's the situation we find ourselves in. We're trying to do a lot of new wellness activities, different ways to um, try to you know help improve the health of our population at the same time you know when we have an older population uh, population retiring younger folks coming in we hope to see that balance out but when you look at that you know then it's what's our total premium going to be who's saving money in the long run is the city going to save probably not I just cut it uh, jump yeah. in and i apologize i just yeah. want to get to that percentage of yeah. how much the employees so it's it varies do you have the so yeah. generally um you know for example if you're on the, uh, the Cigna plans, for the most part, it's 72% uh, the city pays for the single, 68% they pay for the family. Yep. Okay. If you're on uh, if you're Medicare, I believe it's a 50-50 split. 50-50, and the same with the PPO plan, it's a 50-50 mm -hmm. split. Okay, so as I was giving you that scenario, that's uh, as I was talking, I was thinking, it's not apples to apples. I have no idea what they're yeah, with your paying, so that's why when I was asking the question, I would... Um, you're talking about the GIC now? Yeah, I wasn't sure, so that's... Just, as I understand it, isn't that up to the, the yeah, so community? It, well, that's the thing. So the, the, the percentage split is stays local when you go to the GIC. So what, what they have in the city of Springfield may not be what... Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, what other GIC saying, yeah. Yeah. companies have. Okay, thank you. I'm all set. Yep. Thanks. Councilor McGee. It's, oh, yeah. I mean, you've got some sheets, right, yep. Steve? Yeah, yeah it's top secret. Right. What's that? We've got both of them. Go ahead. These are, these, are very, these are preliminary, keep in mind, that... Kurt, like our budget, it's a moving target. Yeah. <laughs> yeah with oh, that, gotta with that throw sheet, that disclaimer out there. Yeah, what that sheet does is the uh, it, it does do a, um, a a quick comparison of what you know the current plans are. So the the five plans that, that you see on the uh, on the left hand side, the Cigna plans, and then the Blue Cross plan. Those are all what your current plans are, and that's your current enrollment. Um, based on those enrollment figures, um, the, the total in red is the total plan costs. Now that's not the city cost, that's the total plan cost. That's split again with the, with the employees on an on average probably 70-30 split. Um, the three columns on the, on the right hand side, those are the ones that um, the Tufts Navigator is what we consider kind of the benchmark plan. That's the plan that um, we see majority of the enrollment go into for GIC. Um, as well as the um, the H N E plan, the G I C H N E plan. Uh, that's the lower cost and local plan um, that you you will see a number of folks go into as well. And then the third one, that's the G I C Unicare. That's the Medicare Extension plan. That's the one that most closely matches the Blue Cross plan, um, and that's where the majority of the um, retiree enrollment is in the G I C. So then further down there, versus giving some crazy assumption, is where we thought. All the enrollment would f would fall. We just looked at it, what it would look like at um, if 100% of your folks went into the Tufts Navigator, then 100% went into the H and E. Obviously, somewhere in the middle there is where the truth lies. It's probably closer to a 17 million dollar number than the 19 or the 14. So, yeah. Are you and familiar with how the GIC works in terms of the carriers that they use? You can, for the purpose of the people at home, you can certainly go over that. Just a you know, just a quick brief. 
um, you know, you have quite a few different carriers or they do not have Blue Cross in there. So they, what, what, what the GIC has is for active employees, they have, they have a Unicare plan, which is a national network. Then they have Fallon, Tufts, and Harvard Pilgrim have what we call full network plans, okay? Uh, a year ago, those three full network plans were not available to new enrollments. So there's, 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 sometimes there's some caveats that are involved with jumping into the GDIC plan. So like last year, you could only enroll in the Unicare plan or one of the smaller network plans. So then you go from the national network, you have three full network plans, and they call what they call Health New England a local network plan because it's regional. Um, and then there's smaller network, what we call limited network plans, which is, uh, uh, for example, Tufts has a network plan that's maybe 60% of the physicians that's in their full network plan. So you get a choice of probably about 10 different plans. Medicare plans, you have a choice of two or three different plans. So generally, you know, what we've used here is the Tufts Navig Navigator, which has always been the benchmark plan that, um, that most brokers have used for the purpose of the GIC calculations that have to be done every year. And it most closely resembles the Cigna plans because it gets you full access to all the Boston hospitals. Um, you know, and all those full network plans will do that. They're very robust plans. Uh, all of them are more expensive than the Cigna plan that we currently have. You know, we can show that to you in the rates. But, uh, and then the Unicare, the national plan, is even more expensive, um, even more expensive than the PPO we have. This Health New England plan is priced very well um, for the purposes of Health New England. Uh, when we um, put, put the plan out to bid uh, just a couple of months ago, Health New England came in literally right where, health, where uh, Cigna is right now. So it's a significant difference between um, what, their, what, their, what their GIC pricing is and their pricing would be based on the experience of the city. Um, so that's, that's pretty much how it works. You get a, every, so every employee has a choice of where they can go. The problem that we've had in the past with Health New England and Blue Cross when we had them together was Health New England was a very suitable alternative for probably about 70% of the people, but about 30% of the people that required to go out of, you know, out to Boston or had some conditions that they felt they needed to go outside of this Health New England service area um, was a very expensive option for them. Okay, so, you know, if you had to go somewhere, you had to pay for it, and you had to pay for it, you know, significantly more. And that's kind of the same situation with the GIC. There's some very inexpensive plans on there if you can find something that's suitable to you. If you, if you need to go and have care in a more in-depth uh, nature, you know, you're going to have to go to one of those more robust plans at, at a, a more expensive cost. The Medicare situation is a little more, uh, is something you need to, um, understand that, uh, you know, the retirees have Blue Cross. They've had Blue Cross for a long time. And uh, for a lot of those, for if you've ever gone to a Blue Cross Medicare enrollment, um, you, you know, they, they've, they, they've, that's a very near and dear uh, um, card for those people in their pockets. So um, the cost actually for all the Medicare plans on the GIC is more expensive than the Blue Cross and each year that kind of offsets some of the difference in costs you get with a Health New England or something like that. So there's, there's a lot of moving parts to this too. And, and um, you know, you can make some, some, you know, try to determine where people will try to, you know, estimate a guess which, what they would choose. And it's still just an estimated guess. So that's the hard part for us. And I think one of the things that's really important to note, um, because we did have Health New England and Blue Cross Blue Shield, so we were able to provide those options, a New England network or just this local network. Um, and Health New England has a product called Here to There. Uh, so you could be here, your doctor's here, everything like everything's here, but if you need to go to Dana-Farber, if you need to go to Brigham's Women, if you need to go to Boston, with the approval of your local doctor, you can go. Now there's, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a convoluted system. It's not perfect by any means. I know it's something that we've spent a lot of time talking with them about and researching um, and ultimately decided that, um, you know, having access to that national network with Cigna was, was mo of most uh, importance. When it comes to the GIC, there is no here to there plan. They don't offer that. Um, so that's why it's a less expensive plan because you do not have any access to Boston. Um, which is why um, we, you know, feel that if it were, if we were to head in this direction, we definitely would be in a situation where more of the population would 
migrate over to the more expensive Tufts plan, be, just because, you know, I mean, I get we, we get the experience reports, we see what it is. We've got some folks with some, you know, serious uh, illnesses or their families or their loved ones, and they need to get out to Boston. So they're going to pay a little bit extra with that. Um, and so that's why, you know, when we take a look at this, um, you know, year after year, it just, it, it hasn't made, um, it did, we didn't see the benefit. We didn't see the benefit. The other thing that's important to note is that um, with our plan design, we start, we go from July to June, we go with our fiscal year. If we were to go to GIC, we can't start until January. Um, so the, the process would be the council would actually uh, pass, uh, I believe they adopt uh, Mass General, I can't tell you off the top of your head, but top of my head, but there's, a, there's something that the council accepts that would start that six month window, which means rather than working with a carrier where they're banking on 12 months worth of experience, where they're gonna see some of those good months, where that's where, you know, honestly, they're in it to make money. Um, we'd be looking at a six month plan, so we would probably have an even more expensive um, uh, renewal rate with whatever carrier we ended up with, Cigna, Health New England, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, between July and January, but at the end of December. Um, so these are just all the different things, and believe me, we have these conversations all the time. And yeah, and the other thing too is, is you know, I, th I think the only way the GIC works for a town is, is if you get a lot of people going into the low cost Health New England option. Um, this year, I think in July, the GIC goes self-funded. Yes. Yep. So they yep. go self-funded. So we don't know what that's going to mean economically to the GIC. Um, you take somebody like Health New England that's losing some major accounts locally. They lost the hospital, for example. Um, uh, you know, so we, you know, they have rates that are, are very, very, very low relative to all the other rates on the GIC. Where that, where those rates are going to be next year is is going to be interesting to see. Um, uh, and you, you know, you go in in January, you don't know what your rates are going to be in July. You know, you you're you're always taking a little leap of faith there um, that you're, you know, that you hope that it's going to work out six months later. So, um, but it is going, it is a, it's going to, it's a self-funded situation that, uh, um, you know, we we feel that there's going to be some pain with some of these carriers going forward. It's just a matter of how that shakes out. And we, the city also loses its ability to negotiate. I started off by saying that it's a two-sided negotiation. It's not just negotiating with the employees of the city, but also with the insurance companies. So Cigna originally came back with about a 13.9% 13 13 13. 13. Yep. Uh, increase. Um, but through working with them, looking at other carriers, we were able to get that down south of 8%. So. Um, we don't have that luxury if we went into the GIC. We're locked in for three years. Uh, so whatever increases come down the pike, literally down the pike, we're gonna be stuck with. Um, we, we, we lose our ability to be able to negotiate um, with, the, with the insurance carriers. And I, and I think we see, we've seen, like, did Pittsfield just leave GIC? Both, yeah, Pittsfield and came Quincy. out of it. Quincy, yep. Quincy yeah, so. Pittsfield, there's more. As we see it, there's more leaving than there is joining. Yeah, Northampton as well had had gone into the GIC yeah. and came back out recently as well. So some of the some of the larger ones who had gone in initially have all s since come back out. They saw more benefit to having the um, the negotiating power, like you were saying. You know, some of these groups that you're just stuck with an increase, albeit maybe sometimes it's you know 10 or 9 percent. But um, you know, we've have a tr had a track record of you know negotiating those you know 13s down to eights, those nines down to fours. You know, so you just won't have that the ability to do so. It's the increase you get is the increase you get. Joe. Oh. The um you know, for one second, Peter. Joe and Quentin, did you guys want to add anything? Uh, Joe, if you just if you don't mind using the mic, you wanna sit or stand, whichever. Yeah. Uh not at all. I'd just like to thank the uh, brokers and uh, Rory for uh joint effort in this. Uh, we work hard every year together. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's not really pleasant, but we come to a conclusion <laughs> that we really do appreciate both. For our we listeners, take, I'm sorry, for our listeners at home, when you say we, will you explain the role and how this works? For a yes. hundred years, it was the mayor, got the brokers together, and eventually something happened. 
you know, in the, you know, contractually it was uh, negotiated with, with the unions, but uh, we changed that, or I should say the city changed they it. changed it, yes. Uh, so uh, the mayor still uh, picks the brokers. It goes out to bid every five years, and it is a, uh, a collaboration of um, union employees, unions throughout the city. Every uh, union member, every union in the city has a member uh, on the board. Also the retirees. Retirees hold 10% of the uh, vote and every union is uh, divided by the number of members that they have on a percentage. And uh, we work together. Uh, like I said, uh, I'd just like to thank these gentlemen for coming down tonight and really uh, talking about the GIC. It really is good to bring out uh, the benefits of the GIC, some of the negatives of the GIC, and the percentages of the GIC. Uh, I think that's a big question, like watching your meetings, uh, when somebody says, like, you know, why don't we go to the GIC? Uh, it's, it's a different percentage uh, that Springfield's paying than what we are paying. Uh, you know, so, and like Kirk said, uh, Health New England is regional. I'm sorry, it's local, not a regional network. And most people will go to the higher plan uh, for better coverage, for more coverage, I should say. Um, thank you. And Joe, the name of the committee? Section 19. Section 19. 32B. Um, Maureen, the quiet broker. Councillor <laughs> <laughs> Tommen. Yeah, th thanks a lot for coming down. And, I, and every year I think we, this is brought up. I, I know I filed something a few years ago, and I'm glad uh, Council McGee brought it up again just to get an idea, to look at the GIC and, and to see what it is. Because I've, I've been in different plans, and my wife's been on the GIC, and now we're on something else. Um, but you stated something, and I was on a, a health and wellness committee we had a few years ago, yep. and we'd meet monthly, and I and so it's gone away. But I think, you know, working on that, um, you know, healthy members, healthy community members, healthy workers, you know, can keep costs down. You know, your diet, your health, your fitness, you know, everything that, uh, you know, sometimes people don't think of that's important to the insurance and, and to the wellness. You know, health and wellness is, is a key. And, and if we could try to do that again and try to keep costs, you know, in check, because I, I know that, um, you know, that's one of our biggest expenses is, is the health care costs, it you is. know, that retirement, um, you know, and it's something that I think us as a counselor, council should try to keep in check as best we can. And I know you, you the city does that with the brokers and the, and the people and the employees, because that's, uh, that's a key to working together. And I know there's some, you know, you know, really um, negotiating tools that are done on both sides that have to be, you know, really looked at. Um, but I, I'm glad that, you know, you brought this down, uh, you came down and explained uh, to us and to the people that have insurance, because a lot of times they call to us with uh, questions about insurance and why, is, why are we paying so much, yeah. you know, um, you know, and it's, it's one of the costs that we have to look at, but we got people in the DPW that are so making 35, 40,000 and they're paying so much in health insurance on a monthly basis, you know, we, we have to think of those people because we represent them. But I, I appreciate the time you're coming down and, and the brokers explain that to us. Really yeah, appreciate and, it. And just on the wellness piece, one of the nice things about Cigna is um, they offer a $50,000 wellness fund to us. Before, Health New England might reimburse you $150 for a gym membership, something like that. Turned out maybe a dozen, two dozen people in the entire city uh, were taking advantage of that. So Cigna says, we're going to give you $50,000. There are parameters on how you spend it. Quinton's actually the chair of the newly formed uh, Health and Wellness Committee. Um, and they've got some exciting stuff that'll be rolling out before the end of the fiscal year with an eye towards some really good programming um, next fiscal year. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Quinton? Quinton, uh, if you don't mind, just use the mic. Quentin Donahue. Uh, just a few exciting things about the Wellness Committee. We are trying to reach out. Uh, we're looking to do um, one of the things that we've talked about, we voted, and uh, Rory is not a voting member of this committee. So it's got two members of, uh, two union members and three members that the mayor's office has appointed. Rory attends the meetings, but he's, he's, not the, he's not the voting member per se. 
So uh, just to point out a couple of things that we're, that we're looking to do with that 50,000 as we come to the end of the fiscal year, we've got and that next 50,000 will be coming in July 1, that we're looking to uh, buy the uh, AED devices, the defibrillator devices, and trying to get them into all the different departments without, within the city. Uh, we're also looking, and I find it exciting, is that for the healthy cooking or healthy cooking, that uh, I've made contact with the uh, culinary department at Dean and at the, Dean, at the Dean Technical High School, for as long as it remains the name Dean Technical, I'll still call it Dean Technical, but at Dean, that the, uh, the, um, the director of the culinary department, who is certified across the board, um, is going to be, is willing to offer uh, classes in healthy cooking and, and healthy uh, you know, meal planning and things. So we're trying to find other different ways that we can utilize that $50,000, not only with equipment, but also just services that uh, Hoyoke employees can, can, can benefit from across the board. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor McGee. Yeah, um, the reason for the filing of the order, same reason we file for new microphones, and we'll see that in 20 years, um, is it's by ordinance. Kevin Jordan crafted an ordinance to have you guys come in and address us every time, of which you're supposed to do certain disclosures and everything else. That is an ordinance. That's a requirement, of which Kevin reached out and said, you guys aren't doing that. Hence the reason why the order came out. That's my job. So with that, we're now complying with the ordinance as it was crafted and put in place. With regards to the wellness, because that's come up now probably four times in discussion, the wellness program, didn't we have a person based off a of grant running the wellness program? Yeah, that, that was part that, of the uh, yeah. wellness prevention grant. Yeah. Where is that person? It's no longer funded. It's no longer funded. That person took another job and the funding ran out. Where, where did that person go? Health New England. No, yeah. is it Health New England or Blue Cross Blue Shield? I think it was Health New England. Was it? Okay. All right, so do we have all the stuff that that person did with regards to the grant? Yes. Yeah. To what? Yeah. Where is it? Well, we just, what they that, do. as I said, we just started, uh, restarted this group now that there's some funding and there's some buy in from folks in the city. Um, the committee's being reformed. Uh, the idea was to take the, you know, we honestly, we fell victim to weather. There were four meetings in a row uh, that we got snowed out. So we weren't able to meet during the winter. Then we got into renewal. Now that we're past renewal, uh, Quentin is, uh, and is really spearheading this, but we have representatives from uh, the police department and Scott Burns, uh, the other union member, uh, Naomi Cologne, the personnel assistant, Cynthia Carbone, uh, who's the director of wellness um, for the school department, and Deb Schreyer, who's the public health nurse. Uh, so we've got a really good team um, that uh, is really uh, putting together a program uh, that they plan on executing um, between the end of this fiscal year and into next fiscal year. All right, so my question is, we accepted a grant for a wellness coordinator of which they work from when to when. I'd, I'd have to, we'd have to go year back and a year and a half, half maybe. Year and a half, yeah. I mean, that was, that was a partnership between the YMCA, the Premier, health center. Primarily Hoyoke Health Center yeah. was, the, was the major. There was some, the YMCA was involved with that. The Hoyoke Medical Center had a, a piece of that yep. somehow. Um, and somehow through that preservation trust, that, that, that there was money available for that position. The problem with the wellness committee at that point in time was there wasn't any money available for anything else. When, okay. when did the person leave and when did the committee say shut she down? She left probably in 2016. Yeah. It was a couple of years ago. Yeah, a couple of years ago. Okay. And was there and, for maybe okay, a year. Okay. So now she left a couple of years ago, or he, whoever it was, left a couple of years ago, and we're now starting up the wellness program. We're getting it back up and running. Mm -hmm. So it's been down for two years? Uh, a year and a half, anyhow, yeah. So it's been down for a year and a half. No, that's not to say, there still were some things going on. Um, we did offer some free Zumba classes. We did offer free yoga classes. Um, we were able to do that. We did that at the senior center. So things were still happening, but what happened was a person who was able to, you know, have some funding behind them and dedicate the time left funding to be able to bring somebody like that on board, uh, you know, went away. And now this 50,000, I wanna be clear, isn't funding any individual, but what it does is it gives um, it gives the ability for the different stakeholders 
to have some purpose rather than just saying, well, we would like to do this and we'd like to do that, but how can we get funding? Now we have funding and we have some very dedicated uh, volunteers, city employees, but still volunteering their time to serve on this committee um, to, to put together a plan and, and as I mentioned, to execute it. All right, so back to my question. A year and a half, two years ago, wellness coordinator left wellness coordinator was there to help in order to offset rates and help bring them down by getting people healthy they had been gone for two years or a year and a half however you want to call it who tracked the grant money that was all run out of the board of health right do we have a copy of how it was if paid out i right? didn't realize that that was something that the committee wanted i can certainly provide you the committee with that love to have it so now with that the question is we heard um we didn't see the benefits. I'm assuming we was that group you're talking about, Joe? Came from Rory. He said, we didn't see the benefit of changing over to the GIC. And he stated a few reasons, but we would represent that whole group. The city. Okay, so, so who's we? The city and the uh, special Yeah. Okay, so based off what? What study did you base it off of? The actual plan designs. The actual plan design that's all in the, uh, all in the pamphlet. Okay, so we have just the information that's provided by the brokers as to how we compare versus the GIC. Is that where we're no, going? No, this, 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 the information here comes directly from the GIC. Okay. It's on the website. That's all you're going off of is just the website. Well, and they they just released, as Joe mentioned, their brochure, their pamphlet, with their plan, um, just last month, was it? Yeah, yeah last month. So all this right. is what they send out to all the members. This so is our total renewal plan is going to be about the, the red number seventeen. Yep. And health New England was fourteen. No, that would be if we went to GIC and went and. In 100%. some kind of scenario, when 100% health New England, which we know from experience wouldn't be the case, because even when people on Blue Cross Blue Shield had the opportunity to go to health New England with the here to there plan at a less, expen at a less expensive rate, they chose not to. Um, so we know that based on past performance that folks will opt for the more expensive plan to have the larger network. Um, so this is just to illustrate you know, this is what it would be 100% Tufts. This is what it would be 100% Health New England, as Steve mentioned. It's, it's not going to be either one of those. And honestly, it's going to be closer to that 70-30 um, option, just based on what we've seen in the past, um, which, you know, puts us a little bit more expensive uh, with the GIC. Um, and then we would still have to negotiate what the city's portion would be and the fact that the co-pays are going up so much. I can't imagine that the Section 19 committee would agree to the same rates uh, that we have right now. So in the end, the city's going to end up uh, paying even more to take care of those employees who are now paying much larger co-pays uh, than they would than they're used to. All right, Joe. I, I have what I need. I, I'm going to review what they have and table it because I'm going to come back with some other stuff. But I'm done for tonight. Is there any other discussion for this evening before we take motions? My, my order, I'd like to table it to come back for further discussion. No, I understand. I understand. I just want to make sure there's no other discussion. We can't discuss under the motion to table. Everybody okay for now? Anybody else? Brokers? Nope. Kurt, you're, you're with uh, Dow, Dow in Ross. 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 Yep. Okay. I had a crisscross, but I, mean, I knew where Maureen was, you know. <laughs> and Gwen, Joe, you guys all set for now? I will, Rory and everybody, thank you. And uh, Mayor Casey is staying with us for one more order, but we appreciate you coming in tonight. And uh, I've forgotten about the, uh, the uh, Jordan ordinance, but that you know, does satisfy that. But we'll it does. get some time to absorb some of this. And thank you. And as a GIC member with the state, there's no doubt that the reason the state it works is there's the high volume of clients, high volume of uh, 
insured um, employees on the state level makes a big difference. It's much more spread out. Experience are dealing with. Yes. And at one time the state talked about opening up the door, but then they kind of <laughs> kind of fibbed on that. They didn't really open up the door the full way for municipalities, but maybe someday they will. But thank you, everyone. Thank you. Guys, thank you very much. Have a good night. Councilor McGee has made a motion to the table. Sure. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Rory, we got the uh, the IT order and Thanks, Rory. That's a good joke to have down the pike. Thanks. Huh? It took me a second, but I got it. <laughs> Clearly. I'm gonna use that. On the agenda, this would be item number six, request of a free cash transfer of $79,000 into one software license, $44,000, and two system hardware, $35,000, totaling the $79,000. Uh, the committee took this up at our last meeting, and when Council, hey, Rory, I, I talked to you, but after you left, Councilor McGee, um, had some questions that we could not answer. Sure. So we reversed our recommendation to table it, and we thank you for coming back with the additional information and see if we can get the uh, the answers to the uh, to the questions of both Councilor McGee and anyone you know who's looking for this uh, this item. Um, Todd, did you want to start? Yeah. Well, why don't you, you got a little handout here of all different dates. Want to explain it? Yeah. Sure. So. Um, so last summer, um, the certain phone systems within the city crashed. Um, we had, um, and you can see this here, it was at the end of July. Um, within a day or so, uh, we were informed that there was no um, way to repair the system. Um, it was very antiquated. The only uh, thing we could do is replace the system. Uh, so we had already, we knew that the phone system was going to have to be replaced. We were already working with a consultant, uh, Rob Chambers, uh, to, to look at different options. And we were looking uh, for both schools and the city at that time. Um, when this happened, because we already had Rob, uh, an engagement with Rob, uh, we were able to tap his knowledge, uh, bring some folks on board. Uh, we looked at two options, um, one from Valley Communications, one from Crocker Communications. Valley had traditionally been uh, the company that serviced our regular copper wire landlines. Um, so uh, we made the decision um, after looking at both what upfront and recurring costs would be to go with Crocker. Um, it was a, essentially a, a three phase um, or a two phase, phase one, one and a half, and phase two, to get to where we needed to be. So uh, the first step was dealing with all the satellite uh, offices, DPW, Council on Aging, Wisteria Hearst. Um, you know, it was, it was a real nightmare. Um, you imagine all those folks uh, that call the Council on Aging, folks that were having issues, you know, with whatever it is, can't get in touch with DPW. Um, so we actually purchased cell phones so that we were able to deal, deal with that. Now, once uh, we got that first phase done and had the systems upgraded, we were on a completely different type of phone system. So um, I, for example, couldn't get a call. Uh, right now I get a call in the mayor's office for DPW. I press a few buttons and it gets transferred. We weren't able to do that. So we then had to upgrade um, the remaining systems. Uh, where we're at right now in that process um, is the retirement board. Um, the retirement board um, is on a separate system uh, that is being uh, up, uh, upgraded. Um, there are some areas uh, at DPW, for example, that might have been wired for a telephone, uh, but the way the system works now is it actually runs off your computer. So you, we didn't have computers in the back bays in the mechanic shop. Um, they didn't need them, right? But they had telephones. So now we're having to wire Ethernet 
uh, to go out there and um, that's the point we're at now. There's also um, our faxes are still on um, an old system. Uh, we need to, we're working to upgrade those. And then the um, voter registration, there's something with the modems. Um, they're actually tied in through the state. Um, so we're working with them as well um, to, to finish that up. But at this point, uh, almost every uh, city office has been upgraded. Um, so what happened, because we're in that situation um, and we're purchasing, it's called voice over IP. So we're buying new servers, we're buying switches, we're buying hardware. Um, we had money um, in the IT budget. Uh, these are, you know, IT expenses. Uh, so we um, used that knowing that we would come in and backfill those lines because we knew that we would need to uh, to get through the end of the fiscal year for our normal IT expenses. Um, and, you know, free cash was finally certified um, <laughs> late. Um, so once we did that, we sat down with uh, HG&E, came up with exactly what our expenses would be uh, between, at that point, that was kind of mid-March, uh, April, uh, through the end of the fiscal year, um, and we prepared the transfers. Uh, the mayor? Oh, maybe Kirk Jonah? <clears throat> I'd have to look at the transfer. I think Todd just jumped into a question I have. Sure. And this might just be housekeeping. Yeah. And I think I know the answer, but the question I have, and I, I might know, kind of know the answer, but I think the housekeeping is important so we understand this budget. Um, the, the IT budget you know, we're used to dealing with a department head yep. and dealing with a department that, you know, comes under the mayor. Of course. As the IT budget, the people who do the IT work don't come directly under the mayor. That's but correct. Come under the gas and electric. Mm -hmm. So is that budget under the mayor's budget on one of those pages that we... It, so the mayor's, and this predates me and I'm sure it predates yeah. the mayor, the mayor's office is traditionally... Um, managed the IT budget in close partnership with HG&E. Um, so the way it works is um, there's four lines uh, in that budget. One is dedicated just to the police department uh, and they have their own technician and they have a contract with and they pay for that. Um, the rest of the lines we actually get, similar to every one of us, we get an HG&E bill uh, every month and the HG&E bill has uh, what the different um, expenses are. So whether it's, we you know just upgraded our, uh, we were still using Office 2003, we upgraded that. We upgraded some different and softwares. The H, that's the IT services. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, so they, they, not only is it the service actually having two folks that uh, sit down the hall uh, that come and service our computers, uh, they also purchase all the hardware. So if someone needs a new computer, um, somebody needs a new type of software, whatever it is, there is a process in place. But HGE expends those funds and then they build the city. So, what this will do is this will go uh, help pay our HGE bills through the end of the year uh, for IT services and systems hardware and license fees. And, you know, we have to pay monthly fees for our backup system, monthly fees for this software license fee, monthly fees for that license fee. That's a separate item. Yeah. So the, the the when I say like so we'll get an actual HGE bill it looks just like the ones you get for your gas and electric service, but it will say backup system two thousand dollars. You know this you know Dell two Dell computers two thousand dollars whatever it is those bills average. I mean I've seen bills you know as high as forty fifty thousand dollars because we're buying new servers, but. You know, one month it might be less than that, one month it might be more. This is, uh, the, the 79 is based on the projections from Kirk at hg and I can say that they've already expended funds, so they're, you know, hoping we can pay them <laughs> for services they've already provided or for uh, hardware they've already purchased and installed. Um, you know, it, it, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it does. That was more general. Yep. But leading into, I think, what Councilor McGee had shared with us uh, two weeks ago, was it when we met? Yep. Or last week, I'm sorry. Um, 
I, I did talk to, to Jimmy Lavelle and, yep. and to get some idea, and, and that explains, you know, I think I, I was forgetting and not looking at it as the the budget item is not completely controlled by the gas and electric, which it shouldn't be, yep. controlled by the city side. Yep. And you, you gave us, I think, a fair explanation of how it's controlled. Um, some of the expenses in recent years was, I think one of the bigger expenses before this telephone surprise was the moving of the planning department, which was very costly, and I believe came out of this about two years ago, out of this line item. The planning office moved back up to City Hall maybe in 2013. It was soon after Marcos came on board and they moved out of One Court Plaza. The, the most recent office move um, that took place was the tax collector down to the old license board room. Uh, the total cost of that was about $5,000 of that. Um, there were, I would say half of that was IT related. Um, I do believe the auditor had submitted something to the council in the last year or so it was asked. Um, what's nice about that is about a thousand of it had to do with moving the phone lines. So with this new system that we have now, there's no more of that. We had an issue um, in the annex over the winter where a pipe burst um, and we had to move some offices around. There's still one employee from the annex that's here in City Hall. We'll be moving back soon. Uh, there was zero expense to that um, because all that employee had to do was take their phone because the phone is now programmed to that individual's extension. So I could go take my phone off my desk right now and I could plug it in in the back office and if somebody dialed my extension it would ring. Um, and so uh, that infrastructure is in place in all the offices now. At that time um, when the uh, 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 tax collector moved down to the license board it hadn't been upgraded with uh, more modern IT because it hadn't been used in such a long time. I can't speak to the cost associated with moving planning to the fourth floor. I wasn't here then. I've never seen a cost breakdown to it. I'm sure there was a, a large IT expense um, associated with that, um, but that that's not what this is. There, there's no offices um, moving or um, no, I, baked I, into this. I just wanted to do a general yeah. inter, you know, give this back to Councilor sure. McGee, but sure. also ask you for this good person sitting behind me. Yeah. Name known as our administrative assistant. Mm -hmm. we, will someone come hook up his phone so we can have a new phone? It's, it's, it's not working yet. Ryan, is it hooked up yet? It's not here, not here. Okay, Ryan, when you get back here, we'll find out. We'll figure it out, <laughs> of course. Councilor McGee, sorry. Oh, no problem. So the IT budget money has been taken out, we're saying? At, at this point, because this, or this it, uh, all these things, yes, this is what we had to spend, um, you know, we were in an emergency situation. We couldn't uh, wait. Free cash wasn't certified. We had money in the budget. It's a legitimate expense. Uh, we spent that money knowing that we would have to come back uh, and backfill to make it through the end of the fiscal year. So at this point right now, um, there's no money left in our IT budget. Do we have a, and this is the breakdown of all the bills for the IT account, you're saying? No, no, no. This is for Crocker Communication. So this is what we spent. These two pages are what we had to spend to upgrade the phone system. What's not here is some wiring that had to get done. I mentioned DPW, back bay. I'm looking for like the that. breakdown of the IT budget and what they spent all their money on. Well, I could certainly get that to you, but the, we wouldn't, the reason I brought this here is if not for this, we wouldn't be back in front of the council. The only, the only, um, you know, we might have, we might have needed a, a couple thousand extra um, when you do the math, there's, there's a couple, two, three thousand dollar difference. We would have found that internally or we would have, you know, come back and found some smaller internal transfer or maybe use a few thousand dollars for free cash. If not for this phone emergency, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We would have had enough money to make it through the, the fiscal year in our IT budget. What was in the IT budget? Um, uh, can you excuse me for a second? I can go get my budget book and I can tell you and that'll tell us you'll also have the breakdown of everything of, so if it was uh, again I didn't know that I would have I would have brought that in I didn't realize that that was what the uh, the committee was looking for tonight so you don't have it you need if you ran to your office you wouldn't be able to get it. um I spent about 15 minutes doing a munis 
report i could i could certainly get that information i would just note that you know it's um we're at a point now where h g and e has stopped paying bills we're about to start having things cut off uh in the city because we don't have money to pay them and they you know can't be paying for things that they don't know that they're going to get paid um did, did we bid this you said we bid this uh proper? it's a state state contract we we solicited two quotes and this was the cheapest quote it was yep and we have and, and i will say that I, I will say that um when we were originally um this conversation with the phone system started a few years back and some of the numbers that we originally uh, were looking at were in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So even though it was an emergency situation, you might think you're going to pay more of a premium at that point. We were able to put together a system that works uh, for a lot less than we thought we were going to have to pay. But we do have both quotes, too. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, there's, uh, I can certainly get that stuff for you. There was the upfront costs, um, which... You know, that first invoice that you see there on the Crocker page, that one for $23,000, um, they were pretty much on par for the upfront uh, up cost, but it was the recurring uh, fees uh, where we saw uh, the savings. I can certainly get that information for you. Okay, and, and you're saying that if we don't pay now, who's going to shut us off? HG&E. HG&E is going to shut us off. Yes. So we, we don't have any time. Time is of the essence. Time is of the essence, yes. Okay. I, I would disagree. And here's my real issue. Mm -hmm. Free cash, you said, is at roughly 180 Well, depending on this order, yes. All right. 91 in, in this order. I think we passed the $10,000 order. So this would be the, the one order in the hop, hopper, which we have not acted on and what's coming in tomorrow night. So tomorrow night coming in is 155 from stabilization? That's stabilization, yeah, that wouldn't touch, yeah, that's not free cash. That's my whole point, Joe. Do we use stabilization to pay for salaries or do we pay from free cash to do that? You know how most of us feel. Which then is, if we approve this tonight, we don't have the argument of using free cash to pay that expense and then balance it and go forward. I don't see HG&E shutting us off. I, I can tell you right now we've had vendors that have stopped working for the city. Oh, well, we'll call Jim Lavelle and we can always talk and I'm sure the mayor can negotiate. The issue is you put, put this through, which we always said you can't fund something unless you show the council the expense and what you're looking for. You've got to request the funds to then go out and bid and do stuff. Here, once again, we're doing it. We call it an emergency. Everything's falling apart. They go out. They cost the city. And now they come back and say, you have to do it. My response is no. We have a serious problem tomorrow. Looking to stabilization as an issue to pay salaries. You don't do that. You'll have 180 roughly in the account for free cash to address that problem if you want. Or you pay this, you take that option out. We have done time and time again paying for bills in a prior fiscal year. It's not uncommon. The budget's right around the corner, of which we didn't get that. If it comes in as a late file, going by what the chairman said, we will not accept the budget tomorrow as a late file. Is that correct? That's what I've been told. So here's the real issue. Which, which expense are we going to pay first? Or are we going to dip into stabilization now? To me, the 79000 can wait. I'm not worried. They shut us off. We'll go deal with the hg &E. It's not like we don't know the people. For me, I don't even know what the quotes were. I don't even know what came out of IT for other expenses in order to see where we paid on certain things. So for me, I don't have enough information to deal with number, this number six. So I will vote no. I'd like to table it until I get my answers as well as address the other issues that we'll have tomorrow night. Thank you. Well, yeah, the issue we're talking about is speculation, but we have an item on the agenda tomorrow for the fire, uh, fire department contract, yeah. which also has an impact, although not union, on the chief. Yep. Uh, a contract which we've never recognized yep. and we've never voted on. 
is actually, I don't think, I, th I think in my humble, very humble legal opinion, the chief's contract is null and void after the vote we took two years ago in the, uh, in the budget. But the stabilization is the issue, and recent history tells us, and I think the, you know, the mayor knows this, that it's unlikely the city council is going to vote to use stabilization monies to, to uh, I'm sure it's a good contract to a degree, but haven't read it fully, but to, uh, to take care of the, the uh, financial um, monies for the, uh, the contract itself. And I think Councilor McGee's point, and this could be, and we can't speak for the majority until we hear from everyone tomorrow night, is, you know, wouldn't it make more sense using stabilization for some emergency one-time expenses like this and using, you know, the, the free cash to, uh, to take care of the, what, you know, the contract if the council agrees with it. That's... I understand. You know, and I'm, I'm, the only reason we're even putting this out is because we're down to, to a couple meetings, you know, two, three meetings for the rest of the year to yeah. figure this all out. And we, we've had, we have, we've got, um, I understand that. It, it, would the sense of the committee be that if the mayor were to put um, a stable, and I, and I realize, um, you know, the council doesn't like late filed orders, but if the mayor was to put um, a stabilization request in for the meeting tomorrow, that the council would act on it tomorrow night if we're able to provide um, Councilor McGee with the info. I mean, it's, it's as simple as going, I'd rather go to purchasing tomorrow and get the actual copies of the invoices from hg &E and give those to you rather than going to my office and printing off a munis report that will be a much more difficult thing to read. Um, we could provide you with every month's invoice. Um, it's, they're very clear uh, exactly what the in and outs have been for these accounts. There's absolutely nothing to hide. Happy to provide all that information to you. Um, and, I, and I understand what you're saying. There are just vendors right now that are expecting payment. Um, we haven't been able to pay our hg &E bill since um, April, middle of March, April. Um, and I know that, you know, th they were really hoping that these transfers would go through tomorrow night. Um, they were actually going to be meeting tomorrow to prepare everything so that once these transfers went through, we'd be able to fast track payment on our end, um, uh, on the council's end. So I, I appreciate, um, you know, what, what the, the, the thought process is here with not wanting to use stabilization for this. Maybe it's a one-time emergency expense. Um, I mean, do you, do you have a sense? Because I would just hate for this to have to go all the way up until now we'd be in June, um, potentially before the next council meeting uh, to be able to pay this. And I'm sure that Jim Lavelle or Kirk Jonah would be happy to come down here for the full council meeting tomorrow, um, would potentially answer any questions. I could provide that information. I, I would deliver it to the clerk's office first thing. It could be provided to the councilors uh, via the communication system that they use, Army uses. Uh, one, one thing the manager did tell me, I, I did some, yeah. some research too, is they don't see all the invoices that come out of this account. The, these are the ones they didn't see. Okay. These, these, these are the ones they didn't see, these Crocker and Rob Chamber uh, ones. Um, but there, are they, someone's got to be watching the account. I get the emergency, but in, in terms of, because what we're transferring in is something that was already budgeted for, and the only reason the money's not there is that's because correct. of the emergency. That's correct, yep. That's exactly we're, we're trying right. to supplement the emergency. That's exactly not correct. Not where it's going. That's exactly right, yep. You know, Yep. And, and, uh, and the argument you told us last week, and, and I, 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 with all due respect to Councillor McGee, too, is the argument is that this is an IT expense. It is. The Crocker yeah, it's, it's, it's um, and what you'll see in the budget is, um, for some reason, uh, telephone uh, in the past have been paid out of the purchasing office, all the Verizon bills. What we've done is we've actually transferred that into the IT budget, so now it'll all be handled um, underneath the IT budget. Historically, that line item was part of purchasing yep. for a hundred years. Yep. And you know, historically, one of those things that we keep forgetting is 
the line items are for 12 months, mm -hmm. not one month. Yep. And even if it is an emergency, by using the IT funds, you did deplete the 12 month yep, budget. Yep, we did. Okay. Yep. So we're on the same page. We are. <laughs> but we got to figure out how to put it. Logistically, anything is possible tomorrow night. I can't make a promise. I can only speak for myself. You know, if, if, if it came in, if everybody was satisfied, it, it'll take, it would take nine votes, mm -hmm. you know, to, to pass anything on the floor tomorrow night. Todd, at the moment, anybody else? Councilor Tomlin? Yeah, I'm just a little unsure here on, on, on this, this whole thing tonight. So you want to put this off so tomorrow that you take the money from stabilization and pay this? And then take the money from free cash if there's enough in there to pay for the other item tonight, tomorrow night, on the agenda? I'm saying if you use this, if you approve this tonight and it gets approved tomorrow, you have no option. If you, you guys still got to address the contract. Right, right. But you have no free cash to do that. That's off the table. So you're left going to stabilization as a possible option. For the which, expense. Which we all know is... Not going to happen. Probably not won't happen. happen. Okay. So knowing that out well ahead of time, this really, and I get it, you know, it's a rush in Russia. I'm not worried about the rush. I'm worried about a serious problem, which is when you start to tiptoe into stabilization, that becomes problematic. That's where everything stops, and you have to readdress it. So for me, don't vote for the 79000 right now until we figure out what we're going to do with the other stuff. If you want to come back with you know, a request from stabilization for 79000 because it's a one-time emergency for bond council, that's a great argument. But you still need nine votes. Plus but tonight, no, I'm yeah. telling you, you really should not be voting for free cash. Plus, there's no guarantee tomorrow night if you do that stabilization that people are going to vote for it. Huh? Either one of them. No, okay. I just wonder how my other colleagues feel on this issue. Everybody else. Well, you I could mean. you could always table it and pull it from committee tomorrow. Yeah, you can always suspend the rules. Oh, no, you can do that. Committee. But... I mean, it's not like we denied it. We're we're trying to figure out what's going to happen. One eighty and being one eighty is the problem. It's low. It's very low. I kind of feel like we have to give options to our fellow counselors tomorrow too. I mean, you can table it, and after discussion tomorrow, you can always pull it from committee. You can, once again, if it's a late file. Yeah. Just so you know, it can be on the agenda anyways for right now on there, you know? Yeah, you can, but you can table it. You can just keep it like that. Yeah. Make the position work without Yeah. Well, there'll be a new agenda anyways tomorrow night, prints it up, right? Yeah, you yeah. can always remove it then. Um, so I guess what we're asking, Rory, if you could bring a message back to the mayor and see what we can do. <coughs> and I, I, as much as the information that you need, Todd, for for the the IT um, breakdown. Yeah, let's see where all the money went. What are you doing with this office over here? Mm -hmm. The old tax collector's office. What are they doing over there? Oh, cleaning it out. Cleaning it out? Yeah. Anything going in there? Um, at this point, no. There was thought that something might, but that's not going to happen. So just cleaning it out? Nothing. Just cleaning it out right now, yeah. Yep. What was the purpose of that move? Which move? The tax collector's office. Moving it downstairs? Uh, better synergy with the uh, treasurer's office? And it, it, you know, it seems to work great um, at this point. Um, it's a smaller office staff than it had been, um, and you know, I know that you know it seems to be working well. Um, you actually are able to go right through not not um, constituents per se, but the staff uh, who do have a good working relationship are able to just walk right through. Um, and you know, Katie and Sandy work well together, so. Um, that was that was the thought process there. Anything going to go in there? At some point, yeah. I mean, I know that we've like a main portion of the building. Yeah, no, we've 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 we've, we've 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 talked about this, and I, you know, um, I know it's been talked about at uh, previous meetings. I mean, I remember Kevin. I remember sitting here maybe two years ago um, and kind of talking about some of this stuff. I mean, 
ultimately what we want to see is we've got um, you know the furnishings the equipment the the carpets we've had some health concerns so you know if we can come up with a way uh, to start upgrading our offices in kind of a, a staged domino effect um, you know we've been having conversations with some department heads uh, about that um, being able to have more modern welcome opening uh, open spaces for the constituents coming in um, how that would work um, once a solid plan is in place uh, of course the mayor will communicate that with the council and you know have have a better you know relationship I know that there was you know uh, some concerns about the way it went down with the tax collector's office and we certainly wouldn't do uh, anything uh, like that again as I mentioned it's just the, the only office that, that's been moved right now is an emergency situation as a result of a you know pipe burst um, and some issues with mold and air quality potential mold we don't think there's mold but potential air quality issues at the same time uh, our assistant registrar our voter ha had recently retired um, we spoke with the department head they didn't have an issue uh, with that person moving in there temporarily and we're, we're working out a plan to move them out um, soon so as of right now you're just cleaning that office you understand you have an ordinance that requires you if you're going to move a department it has yeah to come to us. as i mentioned we we thought um we would be making a move and in anticipation of that started cleaning it up would have absolutely be communicating even that move would have been a temporary um move um but that no longer is happening um so the office i mean if nothing else we had decades worth of old files that were just sitting in there collecting dust that we didn't need to keep anymore so um it's, they've all been cleaned out now so i say you can table it and see what happens okay. tomorrow you can always pull table it but there will be options for tomorrow night mm -hmm. and uh certainly we recognize tomorrow night in the upcoming two well it's actually gonna be three weeks because there's uh, an extra Tuesday in uh, June. In May. In, 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 May? In, in May. May. There's an extra Tuesday in May. So, um, regardless, it's on our radar. We'll do whatever we can tomorrow night. I can't make promises. Roy, I, I think, and, and it's, it's the, the order in front of us coming in includes the amount of money needed for the contract and the amount of money that, quote unquote, the chief's contract is increased because of the firefighters' mm -hmm. contract. I, I think that should be separated too. Okay. To cause to avoid future problems. Sure. If it means two votes. Yep. I get the connection. Yep. But there's also another historical issue that has to be resolved. And sure. You know, I'll stop there. <laughs> no problem. Anything else? A motion to the table. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. Yep. I appreciate Thanks, it. And appreciate what you did bring to the table on both items this evening. We have one other item that Councilor Leahy is going to make the motion, I believe. Yes, give which a motion is to withdraw. Item number eight. Take a, make a motion, take it off the table. Make a motion to take it off the table for discussion. It's introduced by Councilor Leahy. Administration, the city charged an administrative fee on all tolls com completed by the toll companies completed contacted by the city. The fee would be collected by the toll company and paid to the city monthly. The fee should be in line with other cities. Councilor Leahy? Uh, just make a motion to give the leave to withdraw. Motion made a second to second. give leave to withdraw. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Any opposed? So moved. Um, we have, at the moment, I think everybody's seen their agenda coming in for tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, I've already talked, well, not just this evening, but talked to uh, the parties to be that you know we've got tomorrow's meeting we've got a second meeting in may and then we've got i'm sorry two meetings in june and yeah. we're done so plus the budget you know the budget is is obviously the priority if we get it tomorrow night our 45 days goes to i believe june, june 27th yeah. well <laughs> with that aside mr president on the finance committee, we're, we're gonna, we've still got work to do to get done before the end of the year. And Todd reminded me of what the city trends to do is throw stuff at us at the last June meeting. I sent the message tonight. I'm going to follow up on that message is we need everything in by the first June meeting. Yeah. We've got a meeting scheduled. Ryan, what are our meetings scheduled? What Mondays we have booked? 
All right, well, it's one of our regular meetings, which is the off off Monday and one of the on Mondays, just to give us enough time if we need them both. So with everything comes in, we should be able to do it. Um, not knowing some of the things that are tabled here, we'll also have to do. And um, Councilor Valentine's order will sneak in somewhere with the assessors. But I, I appreciate the committee's work, and I know it's that time of year. And when you have uh, newborns and you know young ones, it's even uh, more tiring time of year. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm just trying to wonder where where the message get moved. Which one? A budget. Because I was told during the week that it will be there Friday without a problem. I, I, I was told the same thing, too. And if I don't come know. in as a late file, we took a stand. Accepting late files as last-minute transfers of information that no one in the public gets to see. I understand. Come in tomorrow as a late file? I haven't got the communication. Uh, I... I don't have that answer because I thought we'd have it for the weekend on the agenda. But we can deal with that tomorrow. We're good. Clear our heads. All right, any questions? Next meeting? Is it the 28th? Is it on that calendar tonight? right by. Okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering if it's two weeks from tonight because it's a Monday, so I don't know. No. Um, It'll be in June? After our June meeting? Two weeks from night is, is a holiday, I believe. Yeah, 28. Yeah, so Memorial it's so Memorial Day. Memorial Day it would right. have been actually it would have been that day, but because it's Memorial Day, and someone else already got DGR's got next Monday, it's the following Monday. It's the following two Mondays after Memorial Day. Yeah, gave it down on the fourth, Joe. What? The fourth. The fourth. Yeah. Okay, so that'll right be right before our next meeting. Fourth and, June meeting. and the eleventh, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I and mean, we, we can book other ones, but oh, I was okay. kind of hoping we get it all done in that because. President's going to need nights for the uh, the budget also. Budget meeting, yeah. <laughs> budget meetings, uh, hearings, yeah. Coming up, okay. All right. My favorite uh, motion. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We stand adjourned. Right, thank you. Guys. Brian, I got a couple more here for you. Yep. What did they say they oversaw the um, IT budget? Uh, it's another curve, right? I think. My transmission was it this week. The city? Oh. Or? <laughs> yes, that's that's the trick. Is the, you know those pages? It's not the mayor's budget, but yeah. we always refer to like page yeah. fifty, yeah. like insurance, unemployment. It's all there. It, it comes under the mayor. For the okay. IT? Well, yeah, because there, the IT includes the contract with the G&E okay. and yeah. other things that, you know, expenses that come through the course of the year. So 